Well, good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachaya kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in Committee of the Whole closed meeting. Uh, we did discuss a couple of items. Uh, one with respect to an unaddressed property on Lappins Lane and also um, uh, some land uh, regarding affordable housing land acquisition. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Uh, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Chnani, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have already approved the adds this evening. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, then we will move to presentations. We do have one presentation this evening. Uh, at this time, I will invite Roland Billings to the podium to present the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame inductees for 2024. Need these. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, members of City Council. My name is Roland Billings, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure tonight to come before you to represent uh, President Walter DaCosta, the Board of Directors, and the Selection Committee for the Kingston District Sports Hall of Fame. I'm here to introduce to you the five newest members of the Hall of Fame. With their induction at, at, uh, as the class of 2024 on May 3rd, membership in the Kingston District Sports Hall of Fame will grow to 194 athletes and builders representing Kingston's rich history of athletic excellence. The first uh, person that, that's going to be inducted in May is Jeff Boyd. Jeff is being recognized as an athlete in sailing. <laughs> Jeff started sailing at the age of 12 in the junior sailing program at the Kingston Yacht Club. From those early beginnings, Jeff went on to have a competitive and diverse sailing career for over 50 years. Much of Jeff's initial success came in the laser class, now called ILCA-7, in which he was runner-up at both the Canadian Nationals in 1974, 1975, 77, and 78, and U.S. Nationals in 1984. He won the North American Championships in 1988. Simultaneously, Jeff sailed other classes of boats, including Lightnings, for which he helped earn a Pan Am berth in 1979. In 1983, Canada was putting together a team to challenge for the America's Cup to be held in Newport, Rhode Island. Jeff was tactician on this boat called Canada One. Coming out of that experience, Jeff co-authored a book with Doug Hunter about Canada's challenge. Jeff was also the skipper and tactician on True North, another Canadian challenger for the 1987 America's Cup. Jeff has raced with crew Martin Tenhove consistently over the past 33 years in the competitive 505 class with great success at the North American and world level. Jeff also gave back to the sport, coaching the Canadian 1982 women's national team at the Worlds in Italy and coaching the Korean national sailing team in 1987. Jeff also coached Terry McLaughlin and Everett Bastet, helping them to a silver medal in the Flying Dutchman class in Los Angeles in 1984. Jeff has organized, mentored, and run many youth regattas for future sailors. This mentoring also included his daughter, Danielle, who represented Canada in the sport of sailing at the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. Jeff had a long career with the Limestone District School Board, teaching mathematics and coaching high school sports. Over the course of some 50 years, Jeff has sailed and raced with a multitude of different people, among those many supportive crew members are his wife Florence, his daughters Danielle and Rachel. Born in Fort William, Ontario, August 8, 1955, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Boyd. Our next inductee will be Edward Ted Carson, builder in volleyball.
Born in Barrie and raised in Peterborough, Ted moved to Kingston in 1971 and ever since has continued to be involved in local sports as a coach, organizer, administrator, and official, most notably in the sport of volleyball. As an elementary school teacher, Ted coached volleyball, basketball, cross country, track and field, as well as being involved with the establishment of the Breakers Basketball uh, Program at Ernestown Secondary School and the Guardsmen Basketball Club, but it is in volleyball that Ted has left his lasting legacy in our area. In a six year span at, at ESS, Ted, working in conjunction with Dale Huddleston, coached the junior girls to four CASA championships and the junior boys teams to one championship uh, four silver medals were also won in that six-year span of dominance. In 2007-8, he also coached a U-17 Ontario girls volleyball team to the D2 National Volleyball Championship. Ted has been a volleyball official since 1974 and is well-liked and admired in the local volleyball community for his exemplary character, relentless commitment, and dedication to his sport and the players involved. A member of the Pegasus Volleyball Club for many years, he served on the executive of the club from 1997 until 2017. Ted helped build youth volleyball in Kingston, and in doing that, turned teams into families. His lifetime commitment to sport has had a positive impact on generations of young athletes in our community and encouraged many to stay involved in the sport after they finish playing. Ted has been recognized with the Ontario Municipal Recreation Association Award in 1992, the Limestone District School Board Outstanding Service Award in 2002, the Kiwanis Club Builder Award in 2005, and the Hawk Award from the Pegasus Volleyball Club in 2012, and in 2016, the Ontario Volleyball Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Carson. Our next uh, inductee is Frank Halligan, going in as a builder. Just that, that uh, reaction alone, Frank, tells you how long you've been doing this. Uh, Frank Halligan has been involved in coaching and sports administration for six decades, beginning in 1974 until his retirement in 2023. Born and raised in Kingston, Frank is proud of his connection to the city and its rich history of, of athletic excellence. Frank and Patty raised their sons, John, David, and Robert, in the Limestone City. Their family remains their primary focus and their first team. Frank excelled as a multi-sport athlete at Regiopolis, Notre Dame, before attending Queen's University, but it was during his career as an educator that he began his commitment to becoming a coach, official, mentor, sports organizer, and community volunteer. Frank began coaching in 1974 and continued coaching until 2009. He has been involved with club sports, high school sports, and university athletics that included seven years with the Queen's Golden Gales football team. During his 32-year teaching career, he organized tournaments, convened competitions, and coached over 60 teams. Teams that he coached won high school championships in rugby, boys basketball, and football. He also coached track and field, girls touch football, and organized the intramural sports program at Rigi. Frank Halligan was the true essence of the teacher coach, fully understanding the importance of fostering the values of leadership, equity, inclusivity, and respect in everyone he taught in the classroom and on the sports courts and fields. Firmly believing in the importance of coaching development, in 2007, Frank started a new educational enterprise that offered coaching education conferences for rugby, soccer, basketball, volleyball, hockey, track, cross country, field hockey, and football. Coaching the Coaches offered 12 conferences with 3,000 coaches participating. They were provided clinics by national and international level instructors from across Canada, England, France, Wales, and the United States. Beginning in 2010 and continuing until 2022, Frank was the athletic coordinator of the Kingston and Area Secondary Schools Athletic Association, which entailed convening 12 sports over fall, winter, and spring seasons uh, for the CASA's uh, 13 schools. Developing schedules, communicating with all coaches and referees, arranging playing fields, representing CASA at the Eastern Ontario and all Ontario sports bodies were some of his duties in the position. Frank led the development of the return to play protocols to ensure safe resumption of sport coming out of COVID. At both the local and provincial level, he was instrumental in that. In 2023, Frank continued his representative role on the EASA Board of Directors and the Ontario Federation of Athletic Coordinators. 
Frank has been recognized by many groups over the years, including the Investors Group Volunteer Sports Administration Award, the Padre Laverty Award for Outstanding Service to Queen's University and the Kingston Community, the Barry C. O'Connor Excellence in Support Staff Award by the Longstone District School Board, the Pete Beach Award by OFSA and EOSA for dedication to high school sport, the Leadership in School Sport Award by OFSA, the Qantas Builder Award in both 2003 and 2009, the Queen's Golden Gales Assistant Coach Builder of Men Award, and induction into the Regiopolis Notre Dame Sports Hall of Fame. He is especially honored to have been associated with many outstanding young athletes who have graduated into becoming tremendous citizens and leaders. During his tenure with CASA, Frank developed the phrase on their logo, educating through sport. That phrase represents his belief and philosophy about the role sports plays in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Halligan. Our next ND inductee uh, is Steve Price, going into the Hall of Fame as an athlete in fastball. Born in Toronto, when Steve Price moved to Kingston area, he quickly became a multi-sport athlete at Sydenham High School before focusing on fastball. He became a powerful, hard-throwing, left-handed pitcher and an accomplished hitter that consistently batted in the number three or four spot in the lineup with every team he played for. He has been described as a big game player, and that was, that was uh, at his best when the team needed him the most, as witnessed with his performance on the international stage with Team Canada, winning the International Softball Congress World Championships in 1993, the Pan Am Games gold medals in 1995 and 1999, and he scored the winning run in the 1995 championship. Steve competed locally, nationally, and internationally, and relocated across Canada and the United States over his career before transitioning to coaching the next generation of athletes in upstate New York. Throughout his life, Steve has been described as a humble, supportive team member, a competitor with humility and a great sense of humor, and someone that had respect for his teammates. From 1981 through 1999, Steve was a top performer on the mound and at the plate, starting out with consecutive Ontario softball championships with the Verona Merchants from 81 to 83, before leading Perth Road to the Lowborough League Fastball Championships in 1984. Another Ontario Championship was with the Merchants in 86, before the nomadic travels of a power pitcher began for Steve. He led the Newfoundland Green Sleeves to a bronze medal finish at the Canadian Championships in 1989, and the Kempville Thunder to the Provincial Senior A Men's Championship in 1992, a tournament where he was named Most Valuable Pitcher. The Toronto Gators next came calling in 1993, where Steve led them to the gold medal in the ISC World Championships. In the final, Steve showed his prowess at the plate and the bases with a pinch hit double in the seventh inning and scoring the winning run. In 1995, Steve was back with the green sleeves at the Canadian Fastball Championships, winning silver with a 1.02 ERA and batting a sizzling 474. The next year, Steve won the Canadian Men's Fast Pitch Championship with the Port Coquitlam Rafters from BC before winning the ISC World Championship in 1998 with the Heflin Builders. In that tournament, 17 years after his debut with Verona, Steve was a tournament MVP and set a record for runs batted in with 15 and smacked five home runs in five games while hitting a staggering 563. He was named first team all world as a DH in that tournament and there was one more gold medal at the Pan Am Games with Team Canada in 1999 before Steve continued his career as coach and mentor to young athletes. In his career, Steve Price won five area championships, five Ontario championships, gold, silver, and bronze medals at the Canadian Championships, and four gold medals and a silver on the International Diamonds. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Price. Our next, our next inductee is Megan Sundergaard Pfeiffer, uh, athlete, volleyball. Born in Kingston, Megan was a multi-sport athlete at Regiopolis Notre Dame and LCVI during her high school career. She earned MVP and leading scorer honors in field hockey, ran hurdles and the 4x100 relay in track, winning medals at both IASA and OFSA in both events and earning MVP honors in volleyball at both schools, as well as an all-star nod while she was at LCVI. 
It was as a volleyball player that Megan truly shone. Her play in Kingston earned her a full scholarship to Division I Georgia Southern University, the first Kingston female volleyball player to earn that honor. With the Eagles, Megan was named team captain and from her middle blocker position led the NCAA in blocking statistics while still finding time to maintain a 3.88 GPA and tutoring fellow athletes at the school. During her time at Georgia Southern, Megan was recognized for academic achievements and her leadership abilities, along with winning most improved player, most inspirational player, and most valuable player honors. She was Scholar Athlete of the Year in 1995 and served as the Eagles captain from 1995 to 97, a testimony to her work ethic, her integrity, and her desire to set an example for those around her. Statistically at Georgia Southern, Megan is third all time in solo blocks, second in block assists, and second in total blocks. For a single season, she holds the one and five places for solo blocks, first and second in block assists, and first and second in total blocks, according to the school's 2017 records. In 1998, Megan returned to Kingston and took on the role of assistant coach for two years at LCVI before moving on to the same position at McMaster from 2000 to 2005. She was an assistant coach with the Georgetown Impact Volleyball Club from 2018 to 2023. And in 2023, Megan was a coach with the Ontario Volleyball Association Team Ontario Development Program. As an adult player, Megan won provincial gold with Waterdown at the female Masters Tournament and silver with the same team at the national tournament in 2006. In 2009, Megan won the Five Peaks Trail Running Series, and she continues to be a participant in triathlon, adventure racing, and trail racing. Megan Sindergaard has led a life with a passion for sport, a desire to help the next generation of athletes, but always as a quiet leader, respected by those around her. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Sindergaard. So, Mayor Patterson and Council, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to introduce these fine athletes um, to join the rest of uh, the group that's there, uh, the 194 that represents Kingston's Best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And again, congratulations to all these year's uh, inductees. Um, you're all welcome to stay for the rest of the Council meeting, but... Um, <laughs> We're also happy to pause for a minute if uh, those of you want to continue back to Memorial Hall. Uh, and then we'll just take a moment for everyone to grab their seat and then we'll continue with the agenda. Okay, uh, so we have no further presentations this evening, so we will now continue with our delegations. Uh, we have uh, three delegations on our agenda, and once we've done those first three delegations, then I will uh, open up the floor to Council if there are any further uh, delegations to put forward. Uh, so first, I'll invite Eric McBay to appear before Council to speak to Clause 2B of Report Number 16 from the CAO with respect to the St. Lawrence Business Park expansion. Just a reminder to all our delegations that you have up to five minutes, and then we will open up the floor to questions from members of Council. Mr. McBay. Thank you very much. I'm Eric McBay, Climate Justice Lead at the Providence Centre. It's nice to see you again. Tonight, I'm going to touch on a few different topics related to climate. So I want to begin by thanking you for the decision you made the last time I stood before you. Back in October, you voted to amend an IESO resolution to specifically exclude new fossil generation in Kingston, and other municipalities followed your lead. Not long after, Loyalist Township rejected a proposal that would have put a new gas plant 30 kilometers upwind from this very spot, and Halton Hills rejected a similar plan. The example you set will limit new emissions across the province 
province and save close to a billion dollars of Ontario taxpayer money. Kingston has been proactive on climate leadership and in other areas as well. I've been lucky to be part of the shovel-worthy process that will be discussed tonight, and I have only good things to say about city staff Brandon Forrest and Saru Bajwa. My hope is that you will continue in this tradition of leadership and foresight when it comes time to update your climate goals. As an organizer on climate justice and an active member of municipal working groups and issue tables on climate, I understand your hesitation in setting a goal that you don't know quite how to reach yet. The science from the IPCC and other organizations is quite clear that we in industrialized countries need to reach net zero by 2040 to avoid most of the catastrophic effects of climate change. Limiting our goal to 30 by 2030 is not enough to achieve that. The second 50% is going to be harder than the first, so we need to front load that work. For me, the question isn't, should our goal be 50 by 2030, but how can we as a community reach this very necessary goal? The unfortunate fact is that the provincial and federal governments haven't done enough and that many decision makers at high levels have delayed climate action needlessly for decades. Each postponement has only made things more difficult for the people who go after. No one group or organization can fix it all, but we all have to do our part. Realistically, to avoid catastrophic outcomes, that means 50 by 2030. But doesn't the city of Kingston account for only 2% of direct emissions? That's true. And it's true that what matters is our collective greenhouse gas emissions, not just those from the corporation. For me, though, that's why it's essential that the city show leadership with science-based reduction targets. Otherwise, if we in the climate working groups go ask community members or businesses to reduce emissions by the amounts we know are necessary, they could come back and say, why should we do what the city isn't willing to do? We absolutely need to take action on that 98% of emissions, and we need to advocate to federal and provincial bodies as well. But if we in Kingston want to retain the credibility, the authority, the moral high ground to advocate effectively outside of this room, then we can target no less than the reductions that science says are necessary. Now, I know that the pandemic has made everything more difficult for all of us. I know that you want more information and climate reports from various departments, but I would ask you to make it clear to everyone, staff and community members alike, that your wish as a council is for a climate plan that will do what the science demands. And when the time comes to make a decision, I hope sooner rather than later, please choose a 50% target for 2030. The staff and councillors I've spoken to on this topic support that goal, because even though addressing climate change is hard, we all know that delay will only make it harder. No one in this room wants to pass on worse problems to future councils or future generations. In conclusion, I encourage you to work closely with the community to create a 50% reduction plan and to put that into effect. There are many community members here tonight who are dedicated to mobilizing action on climate, who are collectively knowledgeable about all aspects of energy transition. These people can be your strongest allies on climate and help to generate and implement the solutions we need, including, I'd suggest, a program of local carbon capture in agriculture and forestry to benefit our region's economy and keep offset money circulating here. Let's work the problem together and do what the science says must be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One of my jobs as chair is to unfortunately enforce the protocol that we have in this room. So I appreciate that everyone's come and wishes to show support, um, but applause is not permitted in council chambers. I'm just gonna ask just to refrain from that. That being said, I'm happy to, uh, are there any questions from council? Happy to take them. Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, excellent presentation, and I certainly, I think I speak for myself when I fully say, hey, I'm, I'm on board with this, absolutely. Um, I think, we need to act as leaders in the community, absolutely. I just want to touch upon one thing you said about advocating for the federal government. We've just seen the federal government carve out an exception for climate targets for um, 
uh, carbon taxes. Um, what recommendations would you have for us as council? We do a lot of advocacy work at FC, uh, uh, both with our federal and provincial counterparts. Um, what recommendations would you have for us as council and the community writ large um, to advocate to our federal counterparts who really have all the power here to kind of make massive changes to the in industrial parts of, of the economy that are heavy polluters. Uh, what recommendations would you have for the broader community with that? Me with our MP, uh, I would rec that would be my recommendation. <laughs> I mean, I think those discussions are certainly important, um, meeting with MPs and MPPs. Um, prior to my role with the Providence Center, I worked for the National Farmers Union as director of special projects. And uh, I worked a lot on climate action in rural communities. We were able to secure about $300 million in new funding for on-farm climate action, which has now been rolled out. And we did that by bringing together a bunch of different voices, different kinds of farmers, people from different provinces and different communities, and telling their stories and making it clear that um, there are a lot of benefits for climate action that people and that people wanted climate action and that it was achievable. So I do think that um, that working with community members to do that advocacy jointly is going to be much more effective than doing it just as counselors, right? Because there's the risk, if you go as counselors, to say, oh, we want this, then they're like, oh, the, council, they, the municipalities always want more money, blah, blah, blah. So I think there is a need for, for storytelling and bringing together voices from you know, different kinds of communities. And I think in Kingston, because there has so much, been so much work and because there's so much community passion, as we can see in this room, that is very possible and that's very achievable. I also think it needs to involve collaboration between different municipalities because most municipalities are kind of in the same spot. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to our second delegation this evening. We'll invite uh, Tony Gotsis, Director of Campus Planning and Real Estate, Queen's University, and Catherine Riddell, Project Manager, ERA Architects, to appear before council to speak to Clause 1, Report Number 18 from the Kingston Heritage Properties Committee with respect to the application for Heritage Permit 36 University Avenue. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and members of council for the opportunity to speak with you this evening about the heritage permit application for the reimagining and redevelopment of the Agnes Hetherington Art Center. Before I turn it over to Catherine to speak about some of the heritage aspects of the project, I'd first like to speak a little more about the vision for Agnes Reimagined. This project is, a, is the result of a landmark gift from Bader Philanthropies to enable the Agnes's mandate to further the cause of art and community, a, mag a mandate at the heart of Agnes Etherington's original vision in bequeathing her house to the university. Prior to engaging architects, the university embarked on a visioning process for the project. The central theme emerging from the visioning was that Indigenous and Western worldviews should sit side by side as equals, both architecturally and programmatically within the facility. Indigenous engagement was part of the requirement in the selection process for architects. As such, Georgina Riel forms part of the design team and leads our public consultations. Georgina has led an in-depth program of conversations and listening sessions on a variety of topics. A vital component of this consultation came from the insights and contributions of Indigenous elders and community members. To date, eight sharing circles have taken place and have included hundreds of participants with a wide variety of topics. The vision includes Indigenous self-determination spaces lo located within the new addition for the appropriate care, ceremony, and access by Indigenous communities to cultural belongings currently residing at Agnes. A live-in residence that will ensure artists' practices are at the centre of the gallery and provide opportunities for stays by Indigenous community members visiting the cultural belongings. Engagement sessions further reveal the need for a gallery which is open and accessible to all members of the Kingston community. This includes access to the historic house and for the Art Center's mandate to be expressed through its architecture and programming. We are excited to build on the legacy of the Agnes with this new vision. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so as Tony said, the Agnes Reimagined Project is a unique opportunity for Western and Indigenous worldviews to sit side by side as equals an idea expressed in the Two Belt Wampum and the treaty made between the Haudenosaunee and the settlers in Kingston in the 17th century. 
This project will allow for a renewed understanding of this vision through its commitment to the heritage conservation and repair of the historic Agnes Etherington House and its approach to reconciliation through community consultation, programming, and architectural excellence. Originally constructed in 1879, the historic Etherington House underwent several renovations before evolving into the anchor of the Art Center at Queens following Agnes Etherington's death and bequest to the university in 1954. Since opening as the Art Center in 1957, the house and its additions have undergone several more changes to accommodate developments in gallery methodologies, curriculums, and programs. In the engagement sessions held for this project, members of the community have expressed a strong desire for the historic house to be better and fully integrated within the gallery's plans so that it can be a center for programming and function as a dynamic hub. The project also intends to reestablish the historic house as a home through artists and resident spaces on the upper floors and shared community space on the main floor. The proposed renovations will also make the historic house barrier free and accessible to all visitors. To achieve universal accessibility, the limited removal of two sets of doors and iron balustrades, which are character-defining elements, is proposed in two locations. These interventions will accommodate needed accessibility, accessible entry points and will be fully re reversible. The elements proposed for removal will be carefully repaired, salvaged, and stored on site for possible future reinstatement. The proposal will also provide for the return of character-defining interior French doors, which have been hidden by a previous renovation and will be fully revealed and restored. Kingston Heritage staff and the Heritage Properties Committee have provided extremely valuable insights, which have led to the development of further conservation measures, including a robust interpretation and conservation plan, which will communicate the value of the historic house, the art center, and Agnes's mandate. The project presents a unique opportunity for Indigenous and Western worldviews to sit side by side while furthering the conversation of reconciliation and the field of heritage in Canada. We are very excited to be a part of this project which follows heritage best practices while accommodating an innovative approach to reconciliation and to accessibility. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Council Rostov. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, I just wanted to ask, um, to maybe if you can explain, so some of the things that at Heritage, which I sit on, um, that were the concerns, why it didn't pass at Heritage, um, do I understand correctly that you, because I hear you say tonight, so some of that has been dealt with then, and we have a closer understanding and um, cooperation together, correct? Um, yes, that's my understanding. Yeah. Um, so it was previously thought that all of the French doors would yes. have to be removed. The project yes. team has taken it back and um, looked at some ways that we can maintain more of that uh, important original heritage fabric. And so we will be reopening um, one of the doors and maintaining the interior sets of doors so that they can stay on site and visitors can understand how they were originally positioned within the house. Thank you for clarifying that. That's really important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you both very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our third delegation this evening. Uh, we will invite uh, Robert McKinnis to appear before council, again, to speak to clause three of report number 16 from the CAO uh, with respect to the progress update on impacts and options to increase the corporate, corporate carbon target. I change the slide here? Is it, uh, which is it this? Oh. Oh, that's before, okay. Can I go back? Yes. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of council, city staff and citizens. Maybe I could take this off so you can hear me better. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, to um, stand in for three young people in the, wor in the room. Uh, one is over there, he's Elliot Miller, he's nine years old, and the, my two grandsons, Finn McInnes and Lucas McInnes, who have been good enough to come here and let you know that they're, we're talking about their future, talking about their future. 
my name is Robert McInnes. I'm here as a representative of 350 Kingston, one chapter of the international organization devoted to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. The slide uh, that I'm going to put up next sh shows the wording, oh, did not, <laughs> shows the wording uh, of a petition that we have, we've been collecting names uh, mostly on the street. Uh, and this slide uh, um, got a really good response from the, the public and it reads as follows. I will read it, I'm sure you can too, but uh, we the undersigned ask Kingston City Council to commit to the science-based target of reducing our community-wide and City of Kingston corporate greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% of the 2018 emissions level by 2030. This goal will keep Kingston in step with other Ontario communities such as Toronto, Waterloo Region and Ottawa. Halton Hills has set their 2030 target to net zero emissions, down 100% from today. We have collected 770 signatures so far, and Mayor, here are this. Here's the petition for you. I'll pass it on. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Sorry, going the wrong way again. <laughs> okay, so um, this shows the uh, Confederation Basin Promenade. Um, we are surprised by the proposal to build a $9.5 million promenade over the breakwater in the Confederation Basin. It doesn't seem to have been considered through the climate lens the city has promised us. The promenade will be constructed using hundreds of tons of concrete, which is composed of cement, a product producing very large amounts of GHGs, greenhouse gases, and quarried stone and sand. Quarries destroy important habitat for hundreds of creatures. There is no promenade emergency. The 9.5 million could be used by, for instance, buses to extend busing into the countryside, or 20 kilometers of safe segregated bike lanes, or six new electric buses, or 1,900 grants of $5,000 each to help owners, homeowners insulate their homes. I'm going to go back to the original image if I can find it. Here is the image of joyful children back again. Let's keep their future in mind when we decide how best to spend our money. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from council? Okay. Um, that's okay. I just see surveying. I don't see any questions. I know so they're I fairly rare, but I'd love to take some. So I, I think that we've asked. I don't know if there's any further questions, so thank you very much. No. Uh, so at this point, we will open up the floor to any other delegations which to be added. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. I'd like to make a request for a delegation for uh, Nancy Nickel, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Osanek. Okay, so that we would waive our procedural bylaw to add Nancy Nickel as a delegation to, again, speak to the corporate carbon target. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. I would also like to make a similar motion for Maurice Breslow. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And lastly, for Sarah Gordon, same thing, please. Okay, so again, all three of these moved by Councilor McLaren, seconded by Councilor Osanek. All those in favor? 
Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, Councilor Ostroff. Um, um, sorry, Mayor Patterson. I'd like to add a delegation as well for the uh, Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. Uh, okay, so to add uh, Peter Eamon and Jim Pine. Thank you. Okay. Moved by Councillor Osterhaus, seconded by Councillor Bohm. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, I would like to also make a motion. This one is for Maureen Buchanan and Sean Melnick, please. Okay, and that is with respect to the St. Lawrence Business Park expansion. Okay, duly moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councilor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. One more. Um, I would like to add another delegation. Caitlin Patterson, please. Okay. okay. Also, with respect to the St. Lawrence Business Park expansion, again, moved by Councilor Stephen, seconded by Councilor Amos. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Any other delegations? Okay. Uh, so we will proceed with, uh, we have six additional delegations. So first I'll invite Nancy Nickel uh, to come to the podium and again the, to address council with respect to the corporate carbon target. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Nancy Nickel. I'm speaking on behalf of Seniors for Climate Action Now. Along with 350 Kingston, we sent an open letter to Council. Uh, if there are any questions with regard to that letter, I'm also happy to address that. I am here today to speak fairly personally, to urge you to develop a clear plan to reach a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and to work together with community participation to address this goal. I am a resident of Kingston. I moved here from Toronto in 2019, just before the pandemic hit. But I am not new to this region. I grew up in Gananoque. Uh, I have reviewed Kingston's climate leadership plan and recent reports. Kingston's failure to meet its target of 15% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2022 is deeply concerning. And I am troubled as well by the more recent report to Council that recommends delaying a reassessment of emissions targets until 2025. Speaking as a senior, I'm sure you're aware that seniors are particularly vulnerable to extreme weather. In the past 20 years, heat-related deaths amongst people 65 years of age and older have almost doubled globally. Many older people, unfortunately, lack the resources to avoid or minimize the effects of climate breakdown. When I was a child growing up in Gananoque, at this time of year, we skated for miles on the St. Lawrence River. This year, ice coverage in the Great Lake Basin was the lowest in 50 years. Since 1973, ice coverage has declined by 5% each decade. And of course, this has serious ramifications for the environment. When I was a child during the summer, no one had air conditioners. On a hot summer night, I opened the window. In the morning, I was awoken to a cacophony, a bird song. I could ramble through the woods and fields, and I didn't worry about Lyme disease or other tick-borne diseases. Today, Kingston is an epicenter of Lyme disease. And so we adjust, but some things cannot be adjusted to. Since 1970, we have lost 69% of biodiversity globally. This is due to many factors, but increasingly it is driven by global warming. A recent study found that the North American bird population is down by 2.9 billion. It is a staggering loss, which according to the report's authors, quote, suggests that the very fabric of North American's ecosystem is unraveling. These are simple truths and carry profound implications. The simple fact is we have put far too much carbon pollution into the atmosphere, and we are suffering the impacts of climate breakdown now. Every year we experience more destructive weather. 2019, record floods in Ontario, Quebec. 2020, the largest public health crisis in over a century and another year of destructive weather. 
2021, a heat dome in BC that was then characterized as the deadliest weather event in Canadian history. 2022, Fiona, the largest hurricane ever to enter Canada, and a derecho across Ontario and Quebec, each bringing widespread destruction. 2023, the hottest year on record to date, by far, and the worst wildfire season in Canadian history. We cannot talk only about feasibility and costs associated with de increasing greenhouse gas emissions goals and targets, but we also have to talk about the cost of not doing enough. The International Panel on Climate Change calls for a 50% reduction of greenhouse em gas emissions by 2030 in developed countries. This is what we need to achieve. We recognize that the city of Kingston has done a lot, and we need to build on that. We recognize that provincial policies act as a barrier to local initiatives, and we urge you to continue to pressure the provincial government, and we wish to contribute to these efforts. So let us know how we can work with you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite uh, Maurice Breslow to the podium. Uh, again, to speak to the report regarding the corporate carbon target. <clears throat> Your Worship, members of City Council, my name is Maurice Breslow. I'm a resident of Countryside District, where I and my wife have lived for almost 50 years and where we have raised our family. I came to Kingston in 1973 and have loved this city every day since. I'm here tonight both as an individual and a member of SCAN, Seniors for Climate Action Now, to urge council to do all it can as a municipal body to fight the growing climate crisis. At this time, that means setting the city's corporate emissions reduction goal based on 2018 levels at 50% by 2030 rather than the 30% now in effect. I will not reiterate the facts and figures of the emergency we are in. Others have done that effectively. Unless one is a climate change denier, of which there are fewer and fewer every day, given the dire consequences the world is already experiencing, from extreme heat waves and forest fires to recurrent violent storms, drought in some places, excessive rain and flooding in others, one knows that climate change is upon us and that we have had a major hand in causing it. And so we must have a major hand in fighting it. Quite simply, we have no other choice, none. This is a runaway train hurtling towards us, bent on destroying us. What do we do in such an instance? Do we go on with business as usual, thinking there's still plenty of time, or that it won't happen? Or do we take action to slow it and then stop it? We can and we must, every one of us, from the individual citizen doing whatever they are able, to government bodies at all levels bringing in policies and legislation to fight this existential scourge. And that's where Kingston and City, Kingston City Council come in. For while Kingston has already taken action in addressing climate change, for which I thank Council and the City Administration, I believe we can and must do even more. Oh, people say, we're only a small entity in this. What do we matter? I would say we met a plenty, not only because any action taken by local jurisdictions like ours will help to combat this crisis, but because we'll set an example for citizens and other municipalities to do likewise. It's cumulative. Just think of it. One city or town after another, then one province after another, then one country after another. That's how we'll get there with meaningful action. And one such action Kings can take is to increase its emissions reduction goal from 30% by the year 2030, based on 2018 levels, to 50%. We are confident we can do it. In this, 
the members of SCAN stand ready to offer help in any way we can. I'm sure that's true of other Kingstonians as well, many of whom have experience and expertise in confronting the climate challenge. I come before council knowing that this is surely a trying time to be a political leader in the midst of a challenge as great as the climate crisis. But knowing also that it offers the opportunity to rise beyond one's customary concerns as a counselor and respond to the unique position one is in to help preserve a livable future for all of us. The question is, will we rise to it? It is no longer business as usual. We simply cannot go on this way. The necessary local action is clear and pressing. I urge council to take it without delay, 50% by 2030. SCAN stands for Seniors for Climate Action Now. That's now, exclamation mark. Thank you, your worship and council members for hearing me out. I wish you understanding and wisdom in your deliberations. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Uh, I see Councilor Rosanek on the screen. Councilor Rosanek, go ahead. Thank you, your worship. And Thanks very much for the presentation uh, representing SCAN. Um, I just want to ask, uh, so earlier, yeah, there I am, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, a couple of delegations ago, we heard that Toronto, Waterloo, Ottawa, and even Halton Hills um, are have set goals that are more aggressive than Kingston. Um, do you know um, if what they're doing um, in their in their action plan to get to 50%. Um, is there anything that they're doing, are you aware of, that is different than what we're doing and that we should try? Um, at the last council meeting, like we heard that we have, you know, six electric buses on order and um, two are already, you know, in production. We're going to be getting um, uh, two more, um, well, for the very first time, two electric garbage trucks. And so, like, we're definitely trying. And so, um, I think it would be really educational for council if we could find out if Toronto, Waterloo, Ottawa, Halton Hills, if they're, you know, committing to something um, that's really going to make a difference for them that we haven't thought of or we don't have any plans for. I'm not sure what the question was in that, though. So the question was, um, now in all fairness, Councillor Sanic, this wasn't mentioned in this delegation, that was mentioned in a previous delegation. So, um, yeah. so, so we can ask you the question, sir, I don't know if you know anything about the cities that were mentioned in the previous delegation that have moved from the 30% target to the 50% target. Are there things that they are doing that we are not doing here? If you don't have an answer to that question, that's fine because it wasn't in your presentation, yeah. but. I'm not in a position to answer okay. that. I think there are, there are members of uh, SCAN and members of sure. 350 Kingston who can answer that better okay. than I can. Okay. I, I come as a I come as a as a citizen just like all of us. Okay. Oh, but that's I'm not, sorry. I'm that's sorry. That's my fault. Um, I thought you were representing like that. You were an active member of SCAN. So I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. No problem. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite uh, Peter Eamon and Jim Pine from the uh, Eastern Ontario Warden's Caucus. See, uh, Warden Eamon is, uh, is here with us. That's great. And we'll invite him to the podium to speak to new motion number one with respect to the Warden's Caucus 7 and 7 plan. Good evening, Your Worship and Council. Thank you very much for, uh, for taking our delegation. Jim uh, isn't here this evening. Uh, we have so many uh, requests that we've split up and sending people all over Eastern Ontario at this point. Uh, the Warden's Caucus is progressing, uh, and with a partnership with the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus, on a very ambitious seven in seven. And what we're saying is we want to build 7,000 affordable homes in seven years across our caucus area. So we have 13 members. Uh, 
55,000 square feet, or sorry, 55,000 square kilometers. We um, also uh, represent 103 municipalities and we represent all the housing service managers. And with the, uh, the warden, or with the mayor's caucus joining us, we tell Queen's Park that we represent 1.2 million people. At present, our waiting lists have grown from 14,097 in 2022 to a little over 16,000 right now. So 16,000 in our catchment area are looking for affordable homes. So what we're suggesting to the two levels of government and other possible funders is that we would build 7,000 homes. We've identified 260 parcels on land across our, our communities. We think, and our business case and our model has shown that another 21,000 market rent homes would be built. That would be worth $9 billion to our local economy, the Eastern Ontario economy. So we're very confident in our business model. We've also been out to talk to other funders, pension plans and things like that. We're speaking with the, the province and the federal government. We've spoken to the Ontario East Home Builders Association they're very keen on what we're doing and in fact have joined us in some of our in some of our presentations. We're comfortable with the model that we're putting forward. We're in the process of, of working with uh, the federal and provincial government to, to uh, achieve some funding. What we're hearing from the builders, we need the land. The land is an opportunity for them. Plus we need the two what I call anchor tenants, which is the federal government and the provincial government to contribute. The home builders tell us they have enough to do uh, without us uh, because they're not interested in getting into the rent geared to income or, or the uh, housing market that we occupy. They don't see enough, enough profit and there's a lot of work to it. Uh, they'll only do it if, if they can use it as a portion of, um, like for sake of discussion, 10 affordable houses and then the other the other 90 would be market rent. They would get involved in that, so we, we'd be working on some arrangements with them. Usually the question is, what, what's in it for us? And so, uh, you're grouped with Frontenac County, Lanark County, and the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville, and there would be, it's proposed to be 1,317 units built in that grouping with approximately 799 or 797 being built in this area and that would be left up to the local the local community the the, uh, the count the county and and the city to let us know so we're proposing that we would go to market get some rfqs and then each of the six areas that we've designated would then uh, would then start to tell us where to build and what kind of buildings to build Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Council Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, I see you're still uh, just getting back from Roma. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I still have my badge on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on my way home. <laughs> That's great. I was there with you. And uh, oh, good. Thank obviously, you. Uh, it was a great uh, conference, but it also addressed so much of housing here. So I want to just, on behalf of Council, I, I'm, I'm forwarding the motion with uh, Councillor Baum seconding. I just want to make sure we understand everything. I, I can't say I do, but I, certainly when it comes to housing and ideas, we learned at Roma that we need the ideas. And so what I wanted to ask was, how would it connect with, I've been on the housing board here too, Frontenac Housing. Like, so what's the, it doesn't, it's for us to come up with, uh, well, 799 homeless potentially within our, uh, jurisdiction is that something that would be added to our workload um, or is it how would it be managed so that um, are we just supporting the effort or that will there be responsibilities for us well initially it's supporting the effort and then as the program rolls out uh, you may um, form a, a municipal services corporation and, and that may be the prescribed route for a number of people because it allows the, the taking on of debt and debt's going to be important, and so the, um, and they may, you know, just a scenario. They may come back to your corporation and say, "Could you manage them for us, and then pay you a fee to manage them or, or maintain them?" And maybe at some point they they revert ownership to you. It's going. We're not really prescribing anything. We're going to lay out a bunch of scenarios, and whatever works for each community 
we'll abide by that. Our, what we're feeling is that by, by building large, there will be economies of scale. And our experience is the Warden's Caucus does big projects. We do them on time and with under budget and good value. And we think we can do this as well. All right. Thank you very much. So Mayor Patterson, just to be clear, if I have more questions, we can do that when the motion comes forward and ask, I have a question for our CAO in that. It's probably, that's the time we should discuss it further. Yeah, I mean, if you have questions of staff, then yeah, that would be the time and the agenda. Just, okay. just keeping in mind that this isn't coming right. from our staff. Yes, I know. This is a motion to endorse a project yes. from the Warden's yes. Caucus. So what I would say is if there's any other details about the project, it's probably best directed to either Mr. Eamon or we also have uh, Ms. Uh, Meredith Stavely Watson, who's also here online, if there's any other details. Yeah. Well, I don't I think, think that we, city staff, they're not right. involved in the project, they wouldn't be able to answer those details. Right, uh, except the component of how it would fit with our current housing, affordable housing. So, um, but that is something, I, I imagine we would support this, but, um, and it makes sense to do that. We need to support all the ideas. I just wanna know how it would impact us, as, so. That's my question. Maybe we'll have to deal with that one after. Sure. Uh, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, question is, uh, have we gotten any reports about this, or have you sent an e any emails about your plan to Council to read over? I, I got the addendum about your, your motion of support, but have you e emailed us with anything else? No, we'll be, we'll, we can forward you an information package with Roma. Um, we had a number of delegations, and that preoccupied us to be to be brutally honest, but we do have a, a package of information well forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's just good to know like what I always like to know what I'm agreeing to before I agree to it. Um, but if you if you could forward it to the clerks and to our council, I'd like to read over what you're proposing in the ins and outs is because I'm say, I sit down with Councillor Ramos, uh, Kingston Frontenac Housing, and if we're getting we're expecting them to do more, I'd like to know what we're expecting them to do. So thank you. Yeah. So your endorsement, I won't be sending you an invoice tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. Well, Thank you. <laughs> don't say it to me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor Glenn. Thank you and through you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for taking the initiative to try and find some uh, other solutions to uh, the housing crisis we're facing. Uh, could you speak a little bit more to what it is we're proposing in terms of, of this collaboration? So is it that we're looking, to, you mentioned economies of scale. So is that around um, materials, labor, uh, all of that kind of thing? So could you give a little bit more description? Because I think everyone around here, uh, uh, around the horseshoe would like a little bit more description of, of what you have in mind. Uh, um, notionally, it's, it's all of that plus the, the management of the, of the contract or contracts. Uh, we're not sure that there's anybody that's big enough to take this on across the whole region. We're pretty sure there isn't. And it looks like there'll be, um, just for the sake, again, for the sake of discussion, we won't know until we issue an RFQ. There may be six contracts in the area, uh, in across the Warden's Caucus area, because we use six service areas we've identified. And this, there might be 2,500 pieces of standard language, but there might be um, nine, 90 or 90 pieces of language that's for each individual area. And then there might be different. There might be different styles. We we're looking uh, at modular construction as well, uh, and some of that help will probably be stackable, and some will be row housing, depend, dependent upon uh, the needs of the community. So it sounds vague. It's because we don't want to impose a, a, a method on everybody because we know it's so different from Halliburton down to Cornwall. Uh, Ms. Davey Watson, you can jump in. From you, Your Worship. Um, good evening, Council. My name is Meredith, manager of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. Sorry, I can't be there in person tonight. Um, just speaking to uh, your question, Councillor, at this point, um, we don't have all the answers, and our intent is not to be prescriptive to our, um, I guess, small urban partners like the City of Kingston and our counties. We'd like that to be uh, sorted out through the zones. So that is something um, we are currently working through. Um, to add to Chair Eman's presentation um, and uh, through the mayor as well, we do have a letter of endorsement as well from our Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus partners who represent uh, separated cities across the region. And why the city of Kingston um, 
is interested, of course, in it and should be involved is it's uh, the service manager, as you all know, um, for the county of Frontenac, who is uh, one of the UWC's board members as well. So we have gone and done presentations as well at the two other cities. So that's City of Peterborough and City of Cornwall, who are the service managers for those counties. Um, okay, thank, thank you. And I'm basically what you're asking for then, and I know that we'll have opportunity to debate this, is really a, a general um, endorsement of this that the intent is to collaborate across Eastern Ontario to bring more housing here and that we'll work out the finer details and points moving forward. It, essentially what we're, excuse me, essentially what we're asking for, Councillor, is an endorsement of the, of the concept and then we have to come back to the, the housing managers in the respective communities. Okay, thank you very much again for the presentation and for clarification. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay. okay, and if I might take Board a moment, uh, on you. behalf of the AMO Board, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Patterson for his leadership. I sit on the AMO Board with him and, and uh, as always, uh, enjoy his contribution to our many debates and his leadership, and usually his contribution is, is the way we end up going, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ward Neiman. Great to see you, and great working with you, too. Okay, uh, we have three more delegations on tap. The next uh, delegation is Sarah Gordon, who will uh, speak to Council with respect to the uh, corporate carbon target. Ms. Gordon. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. My name is Sarah Gordon. I'm a master's student at Queen's University. Importantly, I was born and raised in Kingston. I first learned about the mechanisms of government at Sydenham Public School, and then later the realities of climate change at KCBI, where I also fell in love with science. This took me to New Brunswick, where I was studying biology. I remember being so proud back in 2019 when Kingston became the first municipality in Ontario to declare a climate emergency. I was excited to share that's my hometown and the idea that this city was interested in being progressive and a leader in climate action was part of the reason I decided to move back here for graduate school. For context, I was born at 366.27 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Today, there are over 421 parts per million. Even before I was born, previous generations had exceeded the safe accepted limit of 350 parts per million, the namesake of our organization, 350 Kingston. I fundamentally believe it is each generation's job to leave the earth and our communities better than we found it. And this motion to increase the corporate emission target to 50% reduction by 2030 is a key way I believe we can do this. This is the next step of Kingston maintaining its progressive climate action standing and continuing to attract members of my generation and future generations that our city, our councillors and mayor are actively working towards protecting a livable future. Making this commitment does not have to be done in isolation. Even here in Ontario, the region of Halton, as previously mentioned, has a target of 100% emission reductions by 2030. The IPCC report was updated to stress that 50% emissions reduction by 2030 is now necessary to cap warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. You declared an emergency, so act like it is one. Delaying is not the answer. Carbon credits are not the answer. Carbon offsets are not the answer. Business as usual is not the answer. 50% reduction by 2030 is the answer and, answer, and it is urgent that you update this target. Later is simply too late at this point, and we have run out of time. Therefore, SCAN, No Clear Cuts Kingston, and 350 Kingston have requested you pass this motion. Whereas on March 5th, 2019, this 
The city of Kingston became the first Ontario municipality to declare that climate change is an emergency, requiring an urgent and strategic response. And whereas the October 2018 IPCC report titled Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius established that industrialized nations must aim for a net zero by 2040 to prevent worsening and potentially irreversible effects of global heating. Therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff that the greenhouse gas emission reduction target for 2030 shall be 50% down from the 2018 greenhouse gas emissions level and request all city departments to develop plans by the end of Q2 or June 30th, 2024 to meet this target while working with the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, Ms. Gordon, thank you very much. Uh, okay, our next uh, delegation, we will invite Maureen Buchanan and Sean Melnick to the podium to speak to Council with respect to the expansion of the St. Lawrence Business Park. Good evening, Your Worship, Council. Um, Tan Shi, good evening. My name is Sean Melnick, and this is Maureen Buchanan. We are here tonight representing the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Group. Uh, we support the report rec uh, completed for the St. Lawrence Business Park and the recommendations within. You got Sean. Bonjour. Bonjour, Nindinwe Maganaduk. You must all be my relations. Nina Sinekwe, Indigo, Megaze, and Dodem, Bauting, and Donjaba. Maureen Buchanan, Indigenous Cause, Jaganashimong. I think it's really beautiful to hear the Indigenous language. Miigwech, earlier you did that. That's awesome, and I'm seeing some deaf language too, which is awesome. So the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden is a small collectivity of urban Indigenous people and settler allies. Established in 2021, the garden is next to the planned St. Lawrence Business Park. The land is laid out in such a way that there's a shared property line um, of the proposed business park in the garden. And that property line is a seasonal wet area, and there's a hedgerow there, and, and blanding turtles and uh, uh, spring peepers and songbirds live in that area. In addition, we also share the sun, wind, soil, and water table with the St. Lawrence Business Park. Over the last three years, we have been in a rela relationship with the land uh, through, uh, through ceremony, reviving habitats, growing food, and medicines for communal sharing. We have planted over 1,600 native trees and shrubs and two little forests and established uh, pollinator gardens to support native bees and other pollinators, songbirds, and small mammals. On behalf of the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Group, I want to extend, I want to extend a sincere thank you, a chimigwech to you, the council, for the motion that you gave Brandon Forrest and his team uh, the mandate to work with us uh, to define a shovel-worthy approach, an approach that will support the local ecosystem that preserves and strengthens urban biodiversity and meets the needs for housing, jobs, and community connection. Brandon Forrest and Saru Bajwa has been, have been exemplary in building our relationship. Our collaboration is strong, and we are committed to moving the work forward as we work through challenging issues. We share the same goal, developing evidence-informed and action-oriented shovel-worthy principles. Our continued participation of the garden, of the group, of the community strengthens this process and we remain 100% committed. We also see the potential for this work to lift the words of the city's strategic plan off the page and into early adoption and action. The shovel-worthy principles will address climate resilience adaption and urban biodiversity strategies. Imagine a business park in which the ecology is preserved and strengthened by pocket forests in the public realm, stormwater ponds that, out, that also are healthy wet habitats, and nighttime lighting that supports and does not negatively impact biodiversity. Imagine a connected community where active transport doesn't stop at the business park and families meander along walkways to hear the spring peepers. Imagine an ecological corridor of connected habitats to the Butternut Creek Conservation Area. This feature will enable the east end, the whole east end, to support biodiversity, absorb heavy rains, 
and be cooler during numerous hot days over the following decades as the population grows and it will grow. Imagine a business park that has adopted green technologies and attracted businesses prepared to be leaders in creating positive change in cities. Imagine a space that honors and makes visible indigeneity, a great medicine that addresses erasure. So in closing, we deeply and sincerely thank you for your leadership and your time and attention uh, tonight. Chimikwech. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the council? Okay, seeing none, miigwech, thank you very much. Okay, and then our uh, final delegation this evening, we will invite Caitlin Patterson to speak to council again with respect to the expansion of the St. Lawrence Business Park. Is, uh, is Ms. Patterson here? Okay. All right, I don't, I'm just looking at the clerks. Uh, here, do we have? Okay. Let's give Caitlin a minute. We've been having a, a bit of an issue tonight with the people receiving some of the Zoom links, so we have resent her the link. We'll see if she joins. But as of, as of now, she's not in the meeting. Okay. So I'm just going to propose that we will con continue on. If we, uh, if we hear from her in the next couple of minutes, let me know. Otherwise, we'll continue through the agenda. Uh, so we have uh, no further delegations. We have no briefings tonight. Are there any petitions to present? Okay. Uh, we have two, uh, a motion of congratulations and a motion of condolence. Uh, first, moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Glenn. That sincere congratulations of Kingston City Council be extended to Pavna Varma, former president and CEO of the United Way, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, who was appointed to the Order of Ontario on January 1st, 2024. As a dedicated community builder, Pavna has spearheaded important projects like the Community Food Warehouse and Integrated Care Hub, played a crucial role with the Social Services Recovery Group and Kingston Economic Recovery Team during the pandemic, and has organized many successful fundraising campaigns during your tenure at the United Way. Pavna's integrity, compassion, and knowledge have been invaluable to our community. Congratulations, Pavna, and thank you for your immense contributions to the Kingston region. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Glenn, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family and friends of former mayor and longtime councillor Ken Matthews, who passed away in early January at the age of 95. Ken was an incredibly dedicated politician who served on City Council for more than 30 years. He cared deeply about the people he represented and loved being able to help those in need. His passing is a great loss for our community. Our thoughts are with his family during this time. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so my understanding is that uh, uh, Ms. Patterson is now in the meeting. Okay, there we go. Ms. Patterson, uh, welcome. And I will hand the floor over to you. Just a reminder, you have up to five minutes and then we will uh, invite any questions from council. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Kwe Kain and Dishnikaz, Mangadodam, Madawanga, Nojaba, Elginendan. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Dr. Caitlin Patterson, and I'm from the Loon Clan. I'm a mixed ancestry on Anishinaabe Kwe with European and Algonquin ancestry. I'm part of the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden Group, and I'm also the chair of All Our Relations Land Trust. For the last year, I've been happy to be part of the shovel-worthy discussions held between the City of Kingston and the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden Group. My experience in this process has been quite positive. Uh, sometimes communities are consulted without being truly heard. Uh, in the shovel-worthy discussions, however, we've had a genuine and productive dialogue that's led to mutual learning and some exciting outcomes. It's been a strong expression of Kingston's commitment to reconciliation. 
I want to uh, thank city staff, especially Brandon Forrest and Suru Bajwa for going above and beyond to make this such a meaningful and genuinely collaborative process. And I want to thank you council for taking a chance on this new approach. My hope is that this process will help to uplift Indigenous voices and reshape a future-oriented development process in Kingston and beyond. Other cities could learn a lot from what has happened here so far. Kingston has the potential to become a leader with a real legacy. Anishinaabe approaches are often forward-thinking. When we are making an important decision, many traditions ask us to consider how will this affect people living seven generations from now? Our shovel-worthy discussions have considered decades, not centuries, but our multi multidisciplinary team has brought together experts on many different topics from ecology to nutrition to reconciliation. By building in a shovel-worthy way, incorporating more ecological buffers, retaining trees, and protecting naturalized waterways, we can make our community more climate resilient. This needs to be part of every development project that happens in Kingston. A shovel-worthy framework will make this project more integrated into the ecology of the site and also more integrated in into the human community around it. A more naturalized landscape with more greenery, more wildlife, and paths for walking, biking will make this a nice, nicer place to live near and will improve community well-being. I believe that the work done in this process will save the city time and trouble in the future. This is a pilot project and the shovel-worthy framework we develop through this collaboration will be relevant for many years to come. This framework can be uh, used not only for the specific development, but can be applied in a place-based way to many future projects. We fully support the recommendations being brought to council in this report, and I hope that you will continue to support the important work happening as part of the shovel-worthy process, and that you continue to invite more Indigenous involvement in planning and development and more Indigenous knowledge, knowledge into the City of Kingston's practices. We are confident that we can continue working on the emerging concepts and ideas within a shovel-worthy approach, and that more good things will come from this important collaboration. Thanks for your time and support of this process of mutual learning. Shimigwech, Bizindawiyag. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the delegation? Okay, Ms. Patterson, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we will continue on in our agenda. So we have no deferred motions this evening. So we will move to reports. Uh, first up, we have report number 15 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanek. The report 15 from the CAO. Consent be received and adopted. Okay, there are three clauses. Would anyone like any of those clauses separated? If not, we will vote on them as a whole. Uh, clause one, uh, third reading of amended Brownfield bylaw for 18 Queen and 282 Ontario Street. Clause two, Product Care Association of Canada Municipality Lighting Materials Service Agreement. And clause three, supporting social enterprises in the food ecosystem renewal of Keys lease at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to report number 16 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that Report 16 from the CAO recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, the first clause is proposed revocation of the Minister's Zoning Order for the Clogs Road Business Park. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, clause two uh, to 2A, first we have a briefing. Uh, so at this point, I will invite Brandon Forrest, Director of Business, Real Estate and Environment, to brief council on clause 2B uh, with respect to the St. Lawrence Business Park expansion. Mr. Forrest. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so I'm gonna be brief. I'm actually gonna get Saru Bajwa to do the presentation. She's done a lot of the heavy lifting on the, the work that's gone into this and the collaboration. I just wanna take a quick minute to thank her 
and to thank the delegations and just acknowledge the process we've gone through. It has been a, a great learning for all of us, a very enjoyable process, and I hope you uh, appreciate the presentation. I just want to pass it over to Saru and thank her for all the work that she's done as well. So. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Council. Um, it will be challenging to summarize the 10 months of engagement, uh, the exciting journey we had with the Indigenous Food Serenity Garden and their partners, but I'll try my best. Um, in the agenda, we'll talk briefly about the background, uh, the shovelworthy framework, the strategies uh, that are proposed in the concept planning, the concept plans, and uh, then the recommendation in front of Council with the next steps. Uh, the subject expansion lands are located uh, adjacent to and north of uh, the existing St. Lawrence Business Park. Uh, these lands are, it's a 90 acre parcel. It was purchased in 2012 in order to expand the business park. Um, 60 acres is proposed for development, while the 30 acres will be retained as is uh, due to its close proximity to the Butternut Creek. In February, 20, uh, February 2023, uh, Council directed staff uh, to engage with the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden Group um, in order to explore how best to develop uh, these expansion lands with a shovel-worthy approach. So we started the engagement right after that meeting. Um, we had uh, 10 meetings in, during these uh, 10 months. Um, when we started uh, the engagement process, uh, we discussed what was uh, uh, the information that was shared uh, during the delegations in February 2023 meeting, uh, and we realized that uh, there is no uh, framework, there is no perfect definition of shovelworthy that will fit uh, in relation to the business park development. Um, so we were working from scratch. Uh, we were supported uh, by our uh, heritage services uh, staff, as well as uh, we were uh, supported by our, uh, sorry, two con um, consultants, um, Spruce Lab and J.L. Richards. Spruce Lab uh, is an indigenous facilitator and also a landscape uh, planning firm. And J.L. Richards is a planning and engineering support on this. We recently retained uh, Greenscale, uh, who is going to undertake some uh, assessment related to uh, the environmental impacts of the shoulderworthy strategies being proposed in the concept plan. Um, so the, the draft shovelworthy framework, which is attached to the report, uh, is a work in progress. Um, and uh, we have uh, worked on a vision statement uh, for the shovel, what it means uh, for shovelworthy business park. It means uh, to achieve a seven generation stewardship model, uh, which is through ind indigenous wisdom, which encourages people to consider their responsibility in caring for the land, water, air, community, now and for next seven generations while also fulfilling the core purpose of the business park in its form and function. So this is in collaboration with uh, almost 25 participants uh, that we have this framework drafted um, and uh, their contribution in terms of comments and their priorities of how these lands should be developed. They were um, categorized into these four principles uh, which are laid out um, in this slide. Um, these are the values related to ecology, economy, community, and indigenous placekeeping. Currently, we are at uh, phase one of the development process. Uh, we are conceptualizing the layout plan. So the shovel-worthy strategies that are being proposed are at uh, are those at the conceptual plan level. I'll quickly walk you through uh, some of the shovel-worthy strategies that are proposed in the conceptual layout. Uh, the first is an ecological corridor, which is a 30 meter, uh, sorry, 20 meter wide green space that will connect uh, one end of the business park to another, um, the Butternut Creek to the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden. Uh, it will be uh, designed in a way that uh, there are swales and uh, there, is, there are pathways, uh, and it can act as a recreational space in addition to having its ecological benefits. The second strategy is in terms of the road cross-section. Uh, unlike a conventional business park uh, road, uh, we are proposing a more rural cross-section which will consist of uh, swales, uh, plantation on both sides of the road, 
uh, as well as multi-use uh, trail. And we are also proposing a couple of uh, um, pocket forests along the road. The next strategy is related to stormwater. So considering um, the natural grading of the site, two stormwater ponds are being proposed on either end of the site. Um, the stormwater pond, which is close to the indigenous food sovereignty garden, um, is going to act as a buffer. In addition, it can act as a recreational space as well. Um, for all these uh, um, three spaces that I have just uh, walked you through, um, there will be a more holistic landscape design. And one key element of the landscape design would be to showcase um, art and design by indigenous artists. Uh, in addition, signage with storytelling narratives and uh, incorporating indigenous gardening practices. Um, we will also explore the opportunity uh, for stewardship agreements for maintenance of such spaces. These are some of the ideas for uh, landscaping. Uh, the last one on this list is related to the existing conditions and the future needs. So looking at what is uh, the existing topography of the land and plan accordingly, and also looking at existing services, um, existing uh, road network, and plan the site accordingly. Um, the, the future needs consist of uh, knowing like, what is the demand for lots and accordingly the size of, sizes of lots and accordingly prepare the lot layout. Uh, in addition, it's important that we are able to recoup our investment. Um, this is how the employment land model, financial model works. Whatever is the development cost, we recoup them through the revenue. We have to keep the lot prices at market level. Uh, so that would be something that uh, we will be looking at as well. This is a glimpse of uh, several uh, options of concept plans that we are looking at. This is also work in progress. And um, these are, again, incorporating the Shavuot practices. And uh, we will be keep working, we'll keep working with the, these options. And we are going to have a more holistic kind of assessment done in terms of environmental uh, assessments and um, financial analysis and other parameters to figure out a final concept plan. And uh, during this process, we will also be engaging with the uh, uh, public at large. The current uh, official plan uh, designation is uh, rural, and these lands are outside the urban boundary. So the motion in front of the uh, council is that we um, initiate the process of uh, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, and we adjust the urban boundary to include these lands in the urban boundary, uh, while staff will keep working on the shovelworthy framework and finalizing the concept plans. It is an adjustment of the urban boundary, and it is allowed by the provincial policy. Um, so staff has identified uh, lands which can be removed from the urban boundary to swap the lands. And um, these lands, uh, as shown in this slide, are next to the Collins Creek. In terms of next steps, uh, we will be, um, if if council approves the recommendation, then staff will start with the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment processes. Um, this process can take anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, and following that process is uh, other planning approvals, uh, plan of subdivisions, which can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Um, so tentatively, we are two, two and a half years away from having serviced lots. Uh, we will also continue working on the shovelworthy framework and also concept on the concept plans. And uh, we are very grateful for the Indigenous Food Serenity Garden Group and their partners to uh, help us draft uh, this framework. Uh, it is a lot of commitment in terms of time and sharing their knowledge. Um, Director Forrest and uh, myself can answer any questions. OK, thank you very much. Uh, questions, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. First of all, great presentation and great work to staff who took this concept of shovel worthy that we heard from uh, a delegation and really actioned this. Um, I have a, two questions. First is, are, has it just been uh, you and Brandon Forrest doing most of this work? Or is there m more staff that have been in working to develop this shovel worthy concept? 
We did have, uh, yes, uh, it was most of the work was done by us, but we were supported by uh, our consultants. We mm -hmm. were supported by director of heritage service, Kevin Gibbs, our comm staff. So it's a collective effort. And, uh, and also, you know, like there's so much uh, um, work that has been done by the Food Serenity Garden Group. So uh, it's a collaborative uh, work. Terrific, and it was great to hear the delegations and how encouraged they were by the work you guys did. So that speaks volumes, I think. Um, the second question is, you said that you're gonna finalize a proposal of what a shovel-worthy project will be. Do you have any idea of when that would happen? And I know there, there's no definitive boundary. Um, just ballpark yeah. figure? We, we did not want you to put a timeline to it okay. just because um, this is how the work should be done. Yep. Like, you know, there should be room for everyone to explore their ideas and not have a certain timeline. Um, but uh, of course, uh, we are very close to finalizing it. So it won't take next 10 months, hopefully. Um, we are uh, hoping it could be done in next three to four months. Yeah. And thank you. This is definitely something we want to get right at the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. First, I want to thank you for all the hard work for uh, every one of you who was involved uh, in this project. And uh, thank you to the delegations uh, who came to present uh, their opinion today. Uh, my question is, is this proposal has been shared and discussed with all the shareholders who was uh, concerned about this plan from the beginning? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for your question. Um, just to clarify, um, you mean the people who had done the delegation at uh, the last council meeting? When this shovel-worthy yes. uh, plan was proposed, there was also a delegation at that time, and the people live on that direction, indigenous people and the other people, there was, I'm calling them stakeholders, so they was having concern about having this plan up there or project up there. So after finalizing all of this presentation, have you shared this plan with all of those people who was concerned from the beginning? Yes, all those who were in the delegation, they are part of the uh, Indigenous Food Sovereignty Garden Group. Uh, they are their partners. It includes Little Forest and, um, um, and other groups as well. So it means it's uh, all of the stakeholders or people, well, they are happy with, with this plan. All the people that were at the delegation, yes, but we are going to have more um, engagement done for public at large, uh, including businesses and real estate brokers who would have stake in the project. It seems it looks like a very great uh, project, and it's a good work um, done by you guys. And I hope that will be adopted and uh, go go through very well. Thank you very much for your time and presentation. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, good, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so with that we will move to 2B, St. Lawrence Business Park Expansion. We will call the vote then. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, clause three, progress update on impact and options to increase the corporate carbon target of 30% by 2030 to 40 to 50% by 2030. Uh, Councilor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, I just have some questions for staff on this. Um, in reviewing the report, uh, the first section references an in-depth review. And when I'm looking at, um, when I'm looking at this report, it, f it feels a little bit like horse and cart or chicken and egg, where we're, we're given this report and we're not, we don't have all the information. And now we're getting a, a secondary phase of in-depth review, and it's it, it's causing confusion for me, um, and that's why I'm saying horse and cart, chicken and egg thing. Uh, will the in-depth review provide more steps, uh, some sort of concrete analysis? Um, I'm, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Salter Keen. Uh, thank you, and for you, Mr. Mayor. I believe Director Fowler is online with respect to the transit uh, studies that are being completed, and he could address that, as well as uh, Russell Horn from facilities. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Julie. Oh, oops, sorry. Yep. No, go ahead, Ms. Feller. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just an update. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Amos. S with respect to the two uh, fleet um, zero emission uh, studies that we're undertaking, there will be a significant amount of detail in there regarding um, implications on energy consumption, infrastructure um, requirements, funding, and also um, the impact to the operation due to some of the I guess at this point, some of the shortcomings with some of the technology around uh, electric vehicle range, if you think of transit routes and um, the ability uh, for the electric bus to actually complete certain routes uh, due to the, the length of time uh, that the bus is actually out uh, in service. So those um, studies are very in depth and will certainly um, outline a number of, of steps uh, related to the to the fleet piece. Um, I do want to want to uh, say that the the current uh, strategic priorities that we have in place, um, these studies um, will will you know confirm that that what we've already committed to um, we we. We will, we can execute, but will require some additional funding, which um, some of which was included um, and detailed in the 15-year capital plan. So the short-term plan, uh, the 2023 to 2026 um, portion, um, uh, is is incorporated into into those uh, studies through uh, a company uh, called HDR. And uh, for everyone's benefit, they're working with a number of municipalities in Ontario. So we're sharing best practices with them as they go through their studies as well. Um, because Metrolinks um, uh, actually, um, through our Metrolinks group purchasing program, this, uh, this contract is through them. So it's a great opportunity for us to share ideas with other municipalities uh, as well, uh, going through the same study with the same consultant. There's 14 in total. Mr. Horn, go ahead. On the uh, facility side, it's a similar response that the in-depth study that we're currently implementing is reviewing all of the city facilities that use energy, so heating and cooling and electricity. So over 100 facilities are being reviewed for this. Uh, we're expecting the, the report uh, to be available uh, later this, uh, this summer, so near, near August. Um, and it will identify specific measures at each one of these 100 facilities to replace the equipment that is reaching its end of life with a low carbon alternative of that piece of equipment. It will highlight the cost of what that, that upgrade, um, the capital cost of what that upgrade will be, as well as the operational impacts of that new piece of equipment. So uh, as we electrify our heating systems, the electrical uh, cost may increase. So it is looking at the, the fulsome picture of that. In addition to this, it is also reviewing the electrical capacity constraints that uh, that electrifying our heating systems will add to the grid. Um, so this, the study is looking at everything. It is looking at the cost, uh, the capital cost, the operating cost, as well as the electrical impact, not only on our facility infrastructure, but also across the city, um, the, the electrical impact of that. Uh, as Bren mentioned, as we electrify our fleet, uh, that electricity will also be coming out of the, the municipal facilities in a lot of cases. So we need to be aligning uh, where and when are we electrifying, are we adding additional services to make sure that we can meet the needs of, of the different groups. I see you, Hurdle. Thank you, Andrew, Ms. Mayor. So I would just like to maybe add that those studies that were described in detail are going to summarize all of the uh, initiatives that would need to be undertaken, the cost of those initiatives to be undertaken to achieve those increase in percentage for GHG reduction. Furthermore, I think there's a component of this that we need to understand is that we may want to invest dollars in more electric buses, um, change our heating system to electric from gas to electric. There may not be capacity in terms of the overall grid for Kingston Hydro and Hydro One. I can say um, that we have limited capacity, I think, left in both systems. So in the absence of significant upgrades to transmission for both, uh, I think even if the city wanted to 
upgrade a lot of its infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to achieve that. So we need to get that full understanding and also work with Kingston Hydro and Hydro One to see what is actually feasible uh, based on the current capacity limitation. Okay, so this, this basically gives us a solid framework moving forward of what our limitations are and costing breakdowns um, with this study. That's a fair assessment from what I'm gathering on this. The other section I wanted to comment on was the carbon offsets. And the, the last time we did a review or we issued carbon offsets, we sent our own money out to another municipality, if you will. So the proposal to have the internal funds being set up and redirected to stay within the city limits, um, I'm 100% in, in favor of. This is a, a great idea. What I would like to hear from staff is, what are some of the potentials that this could be used for? Ms. Ultra King. Yes, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. At this time, it would be difficult to identify what some of those projects could uh, be used for for the internal funding. Um, I think it's important that we wait for these studies to come forth to show us from both facilities and transit some of the projects and some of the uh, actions that we need to implement, and then we would have a better idea of how that fund could be used. But certainly. Uh, keeping it internal to use for to further our implementation of our climate actions um, is certainly uh, a project that we want to look at and evaluate and recommend to council. So perhaps our working committees that we have on climate action would be assistance in that. Um, and then uh, obviously we've got a lot of user groups that have been here expressing concern um, their input would be very valuable from a community aspect in, in assisting in that uh, endeavor. So I have no further questions at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, just to touch upon something Councillor Amos uh, talked about. Um, so when we're talking about broader climate change, we have keeping in mind that Kingston represents 2% of all climate emissions in the city. Um, is it possible, do we have any regulatory capacity for our other sectors like industrial or commercial or are those other levels of government that can regulate those sectors? Ms. Salter King, go ahead. Yes, thank you and uh, through you Mr. Mayor and I may call on Nathan Mannion to speak to it as well but certainly corporately we have the, the corporation to look at our targets and the actions that we can do within our corporation. Community, we, we do assist in the reduction of GH emissions within our community with our Better Homes Kingston program, our Neighborhood Climate Action program, our Climate Action Fund, but certainly other aspects require provincial authorities. So for example, the Ontario Building Code um, is not at net zero. So until that time, we can't enforce uh, you know, individuals building to a higher standard. We certainly have the green standard CIP that incentivizes the, the construction of new builds to a higher standard, but there's certain regulations through the province and through the federal government that we have no jurisdiction over. Th thank you. Follow-up question. Can we offer incentives, though, to those other sectors using some sort of internal carbon pricing program like we do for citizens to upgrade their homes? Would, is that available to the city if we had the money to do so? So as I said, we have the Better Homes Kingston program yeah. and one of council's strategic priorities is to look at um, furthering Better Homes Kingston to multi-residential as well as to commercial um, development as well that we'll be looking at and bringing recommendations in uh, 2025 to council on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think I, I certainly speak for myself when I look at you know, not being able to breathe the air in June and July and being terrified at what the, what, how our climate is changing and not being able to take my kids to bargaining at all in December. Uh, it isn't, I think, lost on any of us that we're in a climate emergency and Kingston has to be a leader. But we need to know what we're getting into. I hate it when other levels of government say, we're going to meet these targets and they have no plan to get there. Um, we need to know how we're going to get there, and that's what we're endorsing tonight. The steps, the costs, it's transparent with the community of what we're going to do to achieve our carbon targets. 
I want Kingston to achieve this. And I can certainly speak for myself. I've been an advocate across all sectors. We're 2% of all emissions in Kingston. The other 98% of of people, our industrial sector, people who own the houses, have to get on board as well. So I, I appreciate everybody who's come out tonight. Take this message home. Talk to your MP. Talk to your MPPs. Talk to your neighbors and get them on board. Change your patterns of driving, of consuming, and get everybody on board. We're one slice of the pie. We all are in this together. So by all means, we need to advocate, but we all need to work together. It's our planet. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, so I don't know about you, but I've found it to be a real challenge to take all the reading and listening and learning that I've been doing over the past several months and try to parse that thinking down into less than five minutes in a way that explains what I'm thinking and feeling here. Um, so to be crystal clear off the bat, the goal of a 50% GHG reduction in, for 2030 is what I want deeply. It's rooted in global science. And we know from the IPCC report, this decade is critical. I get it. I agree with all the people who have spoken to us tonight. We all want the same thing, which is to reduce emissions and do right by future generations. That's the goal here. The question then becomes how. So it's true, just jumping back to previous reports we've had from staff. So it's true that the corporation of the city of Kingston missed its emission reduction targets for 2022. That was disappointing for all of us. I don't know anyone who was celebrating that. It's also true that, as Councillor Tozo mentioned, City's emissions count for less than 2% of our community emissions. So the city must do its part, absolutely, but I really think we're focusing on the wrong thing here. I think we need to broaden our scope beyond the corporation of the city of Kingston to the entire community that we live in. And yes, the city needs to do its part. There's absolutely no question. We're not saying, hey, leave us alone, let us off the hook. That's not, the, that's not it at all. But can we please take a broader look at the community? What can we do about those other 98% of emissions? And this is where we need to focus our collective attention. So I think it's really important as well to highlight what as council we can and we can't control. Council doesn't control the community and we don't control industry and we don't control businesses. We don't control supply chains and we don't control what fuel the province uses to create electricity for us. It would be great if we could. But as council, we, we do control the corporation of the city of Kingston. And again, that's less than 2% of emissions that we have control over. So the city's working within its capacity to reduce corporate emissions. And that's what this report is about. It's about corporate emissions. Beyond that, in the realm of things we cannot control, the city's working to influence residences, residents, which you just heard about, right? So we can't make people retrofit their homes, but we can incentivize it. We've got Better Homes Kingston. We can't make people stop driving everywhere, but we can incentivize it by building better you know, cycling infrastructure and offering transit pass deals. These are things that are happening, right? They're in the works. So good things are happening. The city's in good hands and we're making progress on climate action. We truly are. And no, it's not as fast as any of us want. I think if we could speed it up, everyone in this room would agree that, yeah, let's do it faster. But that's, we're, we're rooted here in municipal reality, even though we've got this global goal that is true. So I'm saying it again because it's important. The corporation of the city of Kingston is responsible for less than 2% of our community emissions. And I know that a goal of 50% by 2030 would hold the city accountable as a corporation, but it wouldn't hold anyone else. So while it would be symbolic and important, and I would love to get there, I think we need to still look at that other 98%. And it's really important too that waiting for these studies, and to be clear, we all want them yesterday, but here we are, it's okay, they're coming. But so waiting for these studies though isn't going to deter from what city staff are already working on they're not going to stop, they're not going to slow down, and I'm hoping staff can please tell us what they're actually working on in facilities and fleet. We've heard a little bit, and so we don't need to repeat, but could someone speak to what's going on behind the scenes? Because this is the stuff that we community members don't necessarily see happening, but it is happening. Uh, Commissioner Carboni. Uh, thank you, and through your worship. Uh, so speaking from the facilities and the fleet standpoint, um, some of my colleagues may want to add about some of the other initiatives underway in other parts of the city. 
um, for facilities. Um, I think the report speaks to the deep energy audits, the deep carbon audits and retro commissioning that we were doing at all of our facilities. Um, more than 60, 60 facilities uh, to date um, and ongoing. And that's making sure that our facilities are running as efficiently as possible and identifying ways to reduce the carbon emissions uh, at those facilities with uh, retrofits and other improvements. Um, we've also upgraded building automation systems, again, to help with efficiencies. Um, we've reviewed a number of sites for uh, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, solar panel installations. Um, this year we'll be conducting further uh, assessment of 30 sites. Now that the technologies have changed, there's new opportunities to install those panels um, where we didn't have opportunities before. Um, we've removed all oil burning uh, HVAC equipment that actually um, I think just transpired the last one uh, in the last month or so. Um, our group actively pilots new technologies, um, more efficient energy, uh, energy efficient technologies at some of our arenas right now. Um, I believe the second in all of Ontario with, uh, with some new dehumidification units at uh, the Invista Centre. Um, and then ongoing retrofits uh, to lighting, um, other, other, other building systems, business cases are done and identify where it makes sense to invest or um, when uh, some of those, that equipment is up for renewal, then we look at putting in the most efficient technologies. Um, and obviously when we're construct constructing new facilities, uh, we're trying to get those facilities as close to net zero as we can, whether that's with solar, um, and of course, considering what the energy demands and uses are of those buildings, it's not possible with a lot of facilities, um, but where it is possible or it's possible to get close, we are striving for that. Uh, on the fleet side of things, uh, tonight we've spoken about the battery, ele battery electric buses, the two in our fleet currently, there was five approved last year, which are being ordered this year uh, for our fleet, and there's another six that were approved, um, moving towards that commitment of 18 that council, uh, the previous council made. Um, so those will be coming online. As we know, there are delays to the onboarding of that equipment, um, but we are certainly investing in that area. Um, we're also investing in uh, battery electric uh, solid waste cart collection vehicles as part of that uh, solid waste collection kind of uh, model change that we're looking at. Those are being ordered this year, uh, I believe for receipt in 2025. Um, and on an ongoing basis, we look to replace our light duty vehicles with EV or um, plug-in hybrid EVs. I believe we're at 70% um, and growing. So as those renewals come up, we are uh, replacing those vehicles. So um, a lot of action being taken on the, on the facilities uh, and the fleet front. That was a lot. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the Corporation of the City of Kingston is doing things, just to summarize, it's not happening fast enough. We agree with you, but here we are. This is reality, and we are doing everything we can. Now, again, back to that goal of 50%. Yes, that's meaningful. Yes, that's impactful. Yes, it gives us something to point to. See, the city set a goal. But again, as I said before, this does not compel the community to do things. So I want to rally the people who had you know, the, the guts to show up tonight and speak to us. Work with us. This was the first time I've heard delegations on climate stuff say they want to work with us. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like there was a distinct energy in this room earlier. A lot of people have, have trickled out, but there is a movement here and we need to harness this and we need to work together. We are in the midst of working with Sustainable Kingston to really bring them back to the forefront and make seconds. them a powerhouse for the community. So with 350, with SCAD, with all of these groups and young people and, and older people and middle-aged people and babies and children, and we, we just, we all need to come together, we're fractured. So let's come together, let's get a common goal and let's move this. I have a meeting, I'm trying to book a meeting with MPP Shu for some others so we can talk about energy. I know you're gonna cut me off. And I'm meeting with some other community leaders to talk about how we can actually coordinate efforts. So things are happening, don't give up hope, keep thank, it up. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, next is Deputy Mayor Glenn. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I actually wanna point out that what we're discussing is a, a progress update. And so at strategic planning and you know through direction of this council, we asked our staff to have a look at how we could get there. Um, I think a number of communities have chosen this goal, but I don't know where they are at investigating how they're going to get there. So I think we need to really reread this and recognize that this is saying, this is how far we've gotten in trying to figure out how to get there that it's not that we aren't committed to trying to make that effort, 
but it's a lot of work. Um, there are a limited number of resources. So I guess, you know, one of my first questions, you know, to staff is, what's the risk of failure or not being able to meet a 50% goal if we, you know, come forward with this without these reports and without those numbers to understand what's possible? Ms. Salter King. Well, thank you, and to you, Mr. I'm gonna pass this question over to uh, Nathan Mannion uh, to address that question, thank you. Uh, thank you, and through your mayor. Um, so, if we set a target and we don't make it, we only really have one mechanism or tool by which we can make up that difference, and that's through creating a carbon offset or through paying for a carbon offset. But those carbon offsets are often expensive; they're often not local. And when you look at the two main types of carbon offsets that you purchase, they're either a renewable energy project or they are renewable forests in agriculture. So if we're going to be paying money to top up this reduction in emissions, then there's this additional cost that we're paying that's going out for these targets. Whereas if we don't necessarily do that and we focus really on taking all these extra funds that we have, directing them into, uh, into actual projects here, uh, then there's really the potential that you could achieve 50%, 60%. So you could achieve reductions a lot faster and a lot cheaper uh, than by doing these reductions. Uh, you know, one of the examples earlier was Halton Hills. The only way that they have figured out how they're going to reach their 100% reduction net zero by 2030 is by paying for offsets. That's it. That, and, and the other thing is that they're about half the size of Kingston in terms of footprint of greenhouse gas reductions from their community size. So, you know, what we have to understand is that we really need to pump the money in locally to get reductions as fast as possible. And what this, what this is saying is that by not making a target now, by making a target later, we could actually make reductions faster and cheaper. Okay, thank you. So basically it's safe to say that getting these reports is really going to allow us to target locally where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck because we've got a certain amount of resources that we're going to be able to put forward to this. So rather than right now saying, yep, we're just going to go for it without um, any clue on how we're getting there, we could be wasting resources. And so, you know, it, it, and I'm paraphrasing, and certainly you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what this says to me. That if we, for example, committed a million dollars today to do this, we wouldn't necessarily know where's the best place to spend it. And we may waste some of that getting a small reduction. Whereas if we wait and we get the information we need, we can make a big step forward. And yes, I hear the chuckles, I hear all the rest of it, but any time that you advance something without knowing how you're gonna get there, you set yourself up to fail. And I don't wanna see us fail as a community. This is not that big a time to wait. And in the meantime, we've heard we have a number of projects underway. Um, so I'm very supportive of where we're at this, at this point. I'm looking forward to seeing the next report. Um, I agree that keeping the money here to uh, work on our own local contribution to the climate crisis is the right approach to this. So I appreciate all the, uh, the hard work and um, thank you. That, that sums it up for me. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have two questions, and one is um, thanks for letting us give us that information about Halton Hills, that their way of getting to net zero is that they're going to be purchasing offsets. For the other cities, uh, Toronto, Waterloo, Ottawa, um, that have set really aggressive targets, like 50% by 2030, um, how, like what they've pledged for, like that their action plan is is that in any report that we've already received? And if not, could that like just, you know, a summary page be added to one of these reports we're getting in the future? Ms. Salter King. Yes, absolutely. We can include that within our next report that we bring to, to council to include some of the other municipalities that you cited tonight as well. 
Perfect. Thank you. And then through you, your worship, uh, my second question is just um, there's a report that's coming in Q3, which would be, uh, you know, probably the September time frame to uh, the Environment, Infrastructure, Transportation um, Policies Committee. Um, what's going to be in that report? Thank you, and to you, Mr. Mayor. So the report that I'd be bringing to EITP, there's two actually that'll be coming. One is on the expansion of Better Homes Kingston program, but the other one that we'll be bringing is with respect to the Climate Leadership Working Group. And so that's a community-focused group um, that was appointed by council after the adoption of the Climate Leadership Plan. And as we spoke at that time, the city can only do so much and we need the community to do some work as well. So there's 15 community members that sit on this uh, Climate Leadership Working Group. We meet quarterly and uh, from that working group, we've established issue tables. So four issue tables, uh, building energy production, uh, transportation, food and forestry and adaptation. And each of those issue tables have identified community actions that are identified in the Climate Leadership Plan, and we're working on implementing those actions. So the report to EITP will be reporting out on the work of the Climate Leadership Working Group, the actions they've taken, and the work they'll be taking in the next year. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Chenini. Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to say also I'm very happy that we're keeping the funds here to try to fund our own initiatives. Um, but I'm wondering, so I think people are expecting to see a downward diagonal line going from like what we are straight down to like uh, 50%. But it, would it be more realistic to imagine it as sometimes it might be stagnant and then big dips when some projects or initiatives really come into fruition where you see kind of like a jagged um, line downwards where some years you could have a lot more uh, success in a dip and then you know sometimes it might just stagnate a little bit as other initiatives are coming forward. Mr. Manuel? Uh, yes thank you and through your your honor. Um, yes that's absolutely true particularly in the last couple of years if you think in 2019 was the first year we declared a climate emergency they had COVID in 2020 you've had maybe a year where people just started acting things yeah if you have a building where you're doing retrofits, that might take one or two years. Uh, what you also th see is a lot of feedback loops. So as you start to invest in technologies, those make other technologies easier to include and easier to upgrade. You know, when you upgrade your electrical systems, that makes being able to include ED chargers a lot easier. Uh, and, and city staff have talked to, you know, the need for those upgrades. So yes, things are going to take a little bit of time and we're going to see a faster uh, reduction over time. Uh, thank you. And is there also like, because um, I know there's companies that have done initiatives on their own, like uh, the Vellas, I heard they planted over 30,000 trees in the middle of the city and things like that. I mean, are these things that we can kind of promote or try to get other, um, maybe form a package or, or something that we can like say, hey, you know, these people have done this. What can you do as, as a corporation or as a business or even like seeing this um, shovel wordy park? You know, seeing like how there's a lot of um, green initiatives embedded in that, and that would also make the lives of the employees there better because they have like a better environment. So I'm wondering, is there anything that we can do that would really push, uh, especially the industrial and business industry to like look at like uh, what others have done to uh, offset their carbon emissions and so that they can also replicate? Ms. Sultakin? Yes, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, absolutely. So there's a couple of ways that we're doing it now, and we can certainly look at uh, recognizing and acknowledging the great work that uh, some of the community members are doing. So through our Climate Leadership Working Group, the issue table for our uh, buildings and energy reduction, we do have industry sitting on that table. We're working with our uh, issue table right now, developing a survey that we're sending out to the ICI sector to see some of the supports that they may need um, in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and the other is working with Sustainable Kingston. Um, they have their Sustainably.eco program that many uh, businesses and industries sit on and be able to recognize those through you know, the Sustainable Kingston Awards that are offered each year. So there are opportunities to do so and we will certainly uh, look into that to celebrate the success of those industries. Thank you very much and I hope that we can actually crush the 50% um, hopefully. And 
we'll see. So hopefully we can get a lot of work done. Okay, uh, next is Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. And uh, I want to th I also I appreciate all my colleagues' comments here and obviously all the presentations as well and, and uh, the, the, the direction they'd like us to go. Um, but I also want to appreciate the statements of my colleagues and recognizing the incredible work that we're actually doing by our staff. I, I am, um, I actually, as I prepared this week and I actually, you know, did call Ms. Salter Keen today and had my own little um, brain cramp of trying to understand everything that we're doing, but it's been really, uh, she was amazing on the phone. She, she explained, when we go through this recommendation, um, I think I think it's something, as Councillor Glenn said, it's something that we can uh, we can achieve and, and, and it gives us a direction, gives us a, a, a true measure of what we can do. And I think that's the responsible thing to do. So I wanna thank staff for that and for the incredible work that we are doing. We can celebrate that. I, I don't think we need to hang our head low and say we have failed that we are we are we are accomplishing everything that we can do as a corporation and with incredible work that you're doing so i i don't just want to say that i i, I really mean it and uh i think that this is something we can support and moving forward and and seeing how we can achieve the absolute best that we can so i i uh, support this uh, recommendation thank you cancer boom thank you your worship and through you uh, just a, a more of a question to staff um I'm, I'm always been curious why we don't or have never sort of explored this whole green rooftop thing. So, I mean, whenever we, we build a high rise or, or anything like that, it's obviously just like, you know, you kind of picture it just lifting the greenery that's there and just putting it on the roof and it creates natural drainage and everything like that. And years ago, I had a conversation with a, a relatively well-known developer uh, in the city and, and they seemed kind of interested in it but nobody seemed to really know how to do it or how to be the first one and i kind of picture it as as an opportunity we've yet to explore you know all those rooftops out there that you know are just tar and gravel or metal or or something that's really not functional so i, I guess more of a question to staff is is how can we kind of you know build on that or help design the technology that that makes it functional and feasible for developers that want to build you know bigger buildings because we need the housing but we also you know need the greenery and that can have a, a cooling effect on cities as well so where are we with that and and where can we go in the future with that you know can can we turn kingston into a green rooftop city or at least provide some examples that kind of helps it catch on or incentives thanks Ms. salter king uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the program we have is our Green Standard Community Improvement Plan, and we're working right now to develop some education around that program, uh, not only for you know developers, for, for staff as well, and how we can model uh, to a higher level of the Ontario Building Code. So that will be launched in the next couple of months. Um, to We're going to be reaching out to the developers and the residential community and commercial community to, to speak to the Green Standard and how they can model their, their buildings to a higher standard within the uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emission. So that's one of the initiatives we'll be taking on this year and uh, we'll be launching it, as I said, in the next couple of months. Excellent, thank you. I think there's definite opportunity for some people to provide the model and be the first, much like the St. Moritz Business Park, right? It's, it's time we start, you know, doing things differently. And and sometimes being the first is uh, is its own reward. Thanks very much. Okay, is there anybody else that wants to speak? Okay, we will call the vote on Clause 3. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, it is 9.13. I propose we take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 9.23.
All right, folks, it is 9.23. I'm going to ask if people can grab their seats, please. Okay, thank you. If we can just... Um Okay. Okay. So we have um, we have quorum. So we're going to uh, to continue on. Uh, so we are past report sixteen. Next, we'll move to report seventeen from planning committee. Moved by Councillor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that report number seventeen from the planning committee be received and adopted. Okay. There are two clauses. Would anyone like either the clauses separated? If not, we'll vote on them as a whole. So clause one. Zoning by law amendment 705 Arlington Park Place, clause number two, draft plan of subdivision and zoning by law amendment 1075 Bay Ridge Drive. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, under report number 18 from the Kingston Heritage Properties Committee. Moved by Deputy Mayor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 18 from the Kingston Heritage Properties Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there's just the one clause, application for heritage permit 36 University Avenue. Deputy Mayor Glenn. Uh, so I'm going to speak to this, but I just want to clarify on the voting because we have to make a decision. So could I just have you clarify that and then I'll speak to it? Sure. So you'll see that there is a note on that clause that it, uh, it did not pass at the Heritage Properties Committee meeting. However, even with that note given, it is still presented as the original recommendation. So if you want to approve, you would vote yes. 
If you want to agree with the Heritage Committee's refusal, you would vote no. Uh, Deputy Mayor Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the clarification. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we spoke to this uh, to respect the Heritage Committee's recommendation, but to also explain it a little bit. Um, so in bringing this forward, I'm gonna ask a few questions of staff. So could staff please um, highlight the uh, concerns that the Heritage Committee had when they decided to turn down this recommendation? Mr. Gibbs. Thank you and through you, your worship. Uh, much of the discussion focused on the French doors that Ms. Riddle mentioned in her delegation and the requirement to remove those French doors to make the entranceway accessible. The other heritage concern that had was basically the, that was voiced was basically the overall size and massing of the new development and the possibility of obscuring the historic building from certain viewpoints, particularly from the south. Okay, thank you. And were there not some concerns about the um, wooden sort of louvering as well? Thank you and through you, Your Worship. There were some comments about the overall design of the new building, which is not, not necessarily a heritage concern, um, but in subsequent discussion with the applicants, there was some mention about how this actually contributed to um, a reduction in uh, energy loss through the glass. Uh, so there are some environmental reasons for that as well. Okay, thank you. Can you speak to, um, there was a, a subsequent meeting held after this. Can you speak to sort of uh, the response that was received and uh, some of the, um, uh, how the concerns were addressed, if you will? Absolutely, and through you, Your Worship. Uh, the applicants have been very uh, approachable and amenable to uh, discussing the application and addressing the concerns of uh, Heritage Properties Committee whenever they can. Uh, and they seem to be open to continued discussion and working with Heritage Planning staff to uh, ensure the design is um, sympathetic to the historic property. Okay, and a bit more specifically to the French doors issue. And I know that some people will think I'm belaboring the small points, but you know, heritage considerations are about a respect for the past um, and honoring that. So what was the discussion around the French doors with um, uh, Queens and um, Catherine who came today? Yeah, so the French doors are on the north facade of the building, so not the main facade that faces the street, so they're around the corner. Um, in order to make an accessible entrance into the historic building, uh, those French doors would require to be removed. Uh, committee members asked about the French doors and the applicants uh, conveyed the information that if the French doors were to be retained and to have the entranceway accessible would actually have non-reversible impacts to the brickwork on the building, which from a heritage perspective is not ideal. Uh, so the only other option would be if those heritage doors were to be retained would, to, would be to not have an accessible entranceway into the historic building. Uh, and anybody requiring an accessible entranceway would have to enter through the opposite end of the building, through the new structure, uh, requiring uh, moving through two different lifts to get into the historic building itself. Okay, thank you for the answers to those questions. Um, I just wanna speak to the proposal. Um, this is a very interesting uh, proposal, and I think that it's very much in keeping with how we'd like to move forward. There's been a ton of respect given to the current heritage property, but we're a community that's moving forward. We're also a community that is about healing our relationship with the indigenous population. And I think that this exemplifies that bridging of the gap between the two cultures that reside here. Uh, so the build, if you look at it, and I hope that my councillor colleagues have had an opportunity to uh, review what's being proposed there. There was a lot of consultation that happened around this. Um, and at the end of the day, what we've got is a respect for the original intent of this property, which was to honor the arts. But we've expanded 
what we consider uh, to be art in this community, and that's to be inclusive. So this building is about inclusivity. The French doors that are being removed, um, we have an understanding that will work to honor uh, the beauty that was you know, intended in, in putting those doors into the building, but at the same time, opening the building up and making it accessible. That's something that's new. That's something that we're bringing to the table. So now we'll have more individuals being able to have the opportunity to come into this building and to see a flourishing arts building. I think this project is also in keeping with the intent of council at its strategic planning to include artist space. So the fact that we're going to actually give a home to artists in our community, I think is also something to be commended. When you look at the structure of this build, you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, curving features in it, which my understanding are gonna cost a lot more to build. But again, this was done in consultation with our indigenous partners, and it was felt that this was far more in keeping with what they would like to see. So I think it pays homage to the past, but the past of both groups, and this opens up the door to the future. And so yes, you'll see there's a continuing theme on doors here, but maybe the removal and honoring of a couple of old doors will allow us to open new doors to the future of that place and to the future of our community. So I'm still in favor of this uh, proposal, um, but I wanted to make sure that we respected Heritage Committee and the concerns that they brought forward because they're legitimate. We don't wanna lose track of the past. Uh, the massing was a concern, but I understand that there's some step downs and I think that that will limit the impact of some of the large mass of the building. So um, hopefully everyone will vote in favor of it. And um, I think it's a really great project. I'm looking forward to seeing it come to fruition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just want to echo my colleagues' words. I couldn't have said it as well. And uh, I think this is going to be a great project, world-class project. We're going to do something that's going to be um, just a tremendous addition to uh, the university, but also our city. And I echo, too, that, you know, though we supported it, it, it wasn't supported, but I applaud staff for engaging and uh, finding a compromise and, 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 and recognizing the valuable input of heritage still. So uh, I would encourage us to support this and see something amazing come together, an incredible donation, and uh, it, it, will, it will be uh, absolutely amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on Clause 1. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Uh, information reports, uh, we have one information report, November 2023 tender and contract awards subject to delegation of authority. Uh, we have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, we have two motions. First moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Stephen. As requested by Raj Balodia, of events and Operations Coordinator of St. Lawrence Parks Commission, Council designate the event YGK Craft Beer Fest 2024, scheduled for Saturday, June 8th, 2024 at 1 Fort Henry Drive, Kingston, as an event of municipal significance to which a special occasion permit may be issued by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. Number two, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Chinani, that notwithstanding section 3.12 uh, part one and 3.13 part three of the flag display policy, Council approved the application submitted by Sandy McDonald Bell for the flag raising on January 24th, 2024 for Bell, that's talk day. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, on to new motions. We have two new motions this evening. Uh, first, moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Mayor Patterson. Whereas during the October 13th, 2022 Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus meeting, the caucus passed the motion below to endorse the 7 and 7 Regional Housing Plan Vision Statement. The EOWC endorses the proposed vision statement as follows on the Regional Housing Project proposal. And the EOWC will commit to increase our share of rental supply by 7,000 units across Eastern Ontario with seven years and work in partnership with the federal and provincial governments, local municipalities, private sector and nonprofit sector. This will include a regional model that accounts for cost savings, local flexibility and sustainability. This goal will be accomplished through joint procurement and design, incentivization, municipal coordination, land use planning, long-term operational models and leveraging partnerships. An innovative approach to funding, land use planning, engineering, inspection, and servicing will be required. And, whereas there are approximately 12,000 to 14,000 community rental housing units needed to address the municipal wait list across the Eastern Ontario region. 
whereas the EOWC is ready to take a regional leadership role with a bold plan to reduce the wait list and build the supply of community rental housing by developing the 7 and 7 regional housing plan. Whereas the 7 and 7 plan will deliver 7,000 new affordable community rental units over seven years, in addition to incentivizing an additional 21,000 attainable market rate units from the private and nonprofit sectors for a total of 28,000 housing units. And whereas the province of Ontario has established the goal of building 1.5 million homes across the province by 2031 and set housing targets for Ontario's largest municipalities, and whereas collaboration, commitment, and contribution between the Federal Government of Canada, the province of Ontario, Indigenous governments, municipalities, and private and non-profit sectors are key to tackle regional housing projects. Therefore, be resolved that Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston support the goals of the EOWC 7 and 7 Regional Housing Plan. And the Council urges all orders of government, private and non-profit partners to fill the housing gap by collaborating, innovating, and investing in filling the rural housing gap. And that a copy of this resolution be shared with the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, PC, uh, MP, Prime Minister of Canada, the Honourable Doug Ford, MPP, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Paul Calandra, MPP, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honourable Rob Flack, MPP, Associate Minister of Housing, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, and the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus. Councillor Ostar, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. I don't have a, a lot to say about this motion. I was asked to uh, to bring the motion forward, and I thank you for for seconding it. I think that we heard in our presentation tonight kind of what what was going on and wh what they're asking of us. Really, the ask is just to, as the resolve says, that council urges all orders of government, private and nonprofit partners, to fill the housing gap. And uh, so uh, it's really coming alongside uh, and and just respecting the request uh, of a hundred and. 13 other municipalities and showing as a larger urban center that we support this and and um, you know we're, we're we really do demonstrate as a city that we um, are doing everything possible for housing and certainly at Roma this was a, a constant uh, um, theme uh, of the of the two three days there so this is just coming alongside and I think uh, even talking our CAO hurdle she she may want to say a few words Mayor Patterson about uh, what we're doing and also what what this this motion is asking so it's not um, it's it, it's it's a meaningful and uh, this our support will demonstrate uh, that this is something we want to see happen thank you I uh, thank you see you hurdle thank you and through you so um, my uh, understanding and I've had the chance to have a couple of conversations um, with uh, with the folks that are working on this project but it's really for the city to support the concept and be able to um, to be part of this group that's going to work with the provincial and the federal government. There's no question that um, the construction of 7,000 affordable housing units will require funding other than municipal funding. So uh, I think the more voices, municipal voices that we have at the table, the better um, the chances are to get uh, funding from upper levels of government. Okay, uh, anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Toso. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. So I did some back of the uh, envelope. So the ask for that we're having for 7,000 new units at $350,000 per unit is an ask of $2.4 billion, correct? $2.4 billion? Billion. So, I don't think that that's necessarily exactly what's being being pitched now. Okay. Because I, I think that I think there are discussions about funding sources coming from different areas. But yeah, I mean, obviously, there's going to have to be a lot of discussion about the cost and exactly how that's going to be funded. Okay. My Thanks. understanding is that there is not yet an ask down to a dollar figure. I believe that the the hope is to have discussions with other levels of government in order to talk about how this plan could be implemented feasibly. And these would, I, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious, I'm just, I'm trying to understand dollar figures of like what, this sounds great, what, these are, I'm, I'm kind of just trying to make sense of this. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Nordegraff, did you want to jump in on that? Go ahead. Thank you, uh, sorry, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, 
Thank you. And to you, uh, Mayor Patterson, just to kind of add to, to the question and, and kind of to your points, this is really kind of as CAO, CAO Hurdle mentioned, and kind of a general endorsement and support of that broader regional uh, vision. Uh, obviously, uh, we at the city of Kingston are having very specific targets for our urban uh, city kind of jurisdiction, uh, but we are also the service manager for the city and the county of Frontenac. So this is an important development. Uh, kind of, obviously, there is a bold target and a, and a bigger picture of that regional development, which ultimately would also benefit us uh, because we obviously do have uh, uh, individuals kind of moving between cities and we're definitely seeing kind of that pressure in the urban area sorry the rural areas as well so I know the EOWC is uh, is definitely making some really um, ambitious asks um, uh, again as a city it complements the work that we are doing here and it really supports also that broader work for service managers uh, in the eastern regions. Th uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, let's, we're in a housing crisis. Let's be bold. I'm happy to support this. Uh, anybody else on your motion one? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, new motion number two. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Hassan. Whereas universal freedom and peace for all humans is an inherent right under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and is proclaimed by the Ontario Human Rights Code. Whereas the current Israel-Gaza conflict has created profound grief, fear, and hurt in our community as we grieve the tragic loss of innocent lives on both sides of the conflict. And whereas all lives are equally valuable and important, and in the midst of conflict, we must also recall our common humanity and agree that all loss of innocent life is a tragedy. And whereas there has been an increasing amount of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism both here in Kingston and throughout the country, causing concerns for safety for members of the Muslim and Jewish communities. And whereas an important part of building a diverse, inclusive community is to denounce all forms of hate, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Therefore be it resolved that Kingston City Council formally expresses its grief and regret at the loss of all innocent life in the Israel-Gaza conflict, and that Kingston City Council formally denounces both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in all forms in our community and expresses its support for all members of both our Muslim and Jewish communities. And that Kingston City Council continues to lead by example in providing an environment where respectful freedom of expression, dialogue, and assembly within the boundaries set by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is encouraged without fear of losing employment or reprisal. And that Kingston City Council encourages all community partners to work with city staff and helping to distribute an anti-hate package of information, including resources available to support individuals and communities experiencing hate crimes. And then a copy of this motion be sent to Mark Gerritsen, MP, Kingston and the Islands. Councillor Ridge, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, I want to begin by thanking Councillor Hassan for seconding this motion, uh, all the help that he had in putting it together, and uh, his support through the process. I want to thank you as well. Uh, your worship for all of your assistance and I want to thank the leadership from Beth Israel and the Islamic Society of Kingston. Uh, this motion would not have moved forward uh, without their input and support and uh, so thank you to everyone for your patience uh, in getting this motion forward. Uh, the spirit of this in, or the intention of this motion is to recognize the grief and pain felt by Jewish and Muslim members of the Kingston community to denounce the hatred they are experiencing to encourage open, respectful dialogue and expression, and to direct staff to provide additional resources for supporting people and organizations experiencing hate crimes. I had the privilege of attending two events at Beth Israel Synagogue. Um, one was just after October 7th, and one was a town hall where Jewish students and their families were sharing their concerns about safety here in Kingston. Uh, they were telling me uh, about the dramatic increase in anti-Semitism um, and, and some of their concerns there, I, I listened to them and they shared their pain with me very openly and um, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for people there putting their confidence in me and being so open. Uh, I think that this is a time for moral clarity. Hate comes in many forms, such as hatred rooted in racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, and all these forms of hate and others must be condemned. It is not just, nor is it right, to hate someone for their faith or their background. This hatred should be condemned whenever we see it, and we are seeing more of it in person and online. 
Uh, we cannot turn a blind eye uh, with the hope that it will just go away. Ignorance allows prejudices to get worse. In Toronto, reported hate crimes have increased by 42% in uh, 2023. We've seen too many examples of violence and intimidation against Jewish and Muslim people in Canada. People are scared. When that hurt and fear is present, we as leaders and representatives in the community, we have to say, we hear you and we are here for you. Um, this includes listening and providing support. I don't want to spend my time focusing on all of these negative things without talking about all of the great good that I've seen in Kingston. Um, despite their pain, uh, members of the Jewish and Muslim communities here have been open and tremendously kind. I have seen many examples of people helping other people, listening, supporting one another. I've witnessed community groups trying to find consensus with each other, and even when it's not successful, the fact that they're trying is, it is incredibly encouraging. Kingston is one of 444 municipalities in Ontario. We are a strong community and we can be welcome. Uh, we must find ways to work together and not separate people. When we start by listening to each other in good faith and with good intentions, uh, this enacts a level of respect and kindness to one another. Um, where there is kindness, there is the hope for something better. And if we can be an example of that here in our community to those people who are in need, then maybe that can ha happen somewhere else. Um, so I want to thank everyone for listening. I hope you'll support this motion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and I recognize you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. I, I think, Councillor Ridge, I think that was very well said. Uh, I think that uh, I want to thank you and Councillor Son for bringing this forward. I think this is an important moment of leadership to show how we address what is a very challenging, polarizing, and difficult issue in our community. But the spirit of this motion is to recognize the pain, to grieve the loss of innocent life, to emphasize our common humanity, and in a world that is becoming increasingly divisive and polarized, uh, to be able to demonstrate that there is still a way that we can come together, that we can talk, we can have dialogue, and that ultimately that has to be the model of how we move forward. So thank you, and I'm happy to support the motion. Thank you, and I return the chair. Okay, if there's nobody else that wishes to speak, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, I'll ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 3-2024, held Tuesday, January 9th, 2024, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Madam Clerk, cross for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that bylaws 2 through 20 be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that bylaws 1 through 20 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Deputy Mayor Glenn. All those in favor? Opposed, and we're adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>